All right, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. There are no microphones here, so just checking. Can you hear me? Can you hear us until the back of the room? Okay. Let's say we all have to speak up and then things will be uh, perfectly fine. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the presentation of the 23rd edition of Social Policy in the EU, the Bilan Social, as we call it uh, in England. Um, at the end of December, each time we get a little spared and we wonder whether this year we're going to manage. And by the end of January, we're happy that it's uh, finally done in two languages. This is already the thanks. All the authors, the contributors, the editors, the, the, the staff at ETY, everybody who made this uh, possible. We did it again, the Le Bilan Social in two languages. It's done. So let's get started. Um, very happy that we can actually uh, meet again uh, physically. As, it, as you know, this is the first time in three years that we can uh, discuss uh, uh, the live audience, our, our new book uh, since uh, March, 13th of March, 2022, uh, when Philippe Pochet uh, from the ETY uh, closed our final conference or our conference in Brussels uh, with the words, we will wake up in a new world uh, tomorrow. He was right uh, again. Uh, one of the positive elements of the new world that we've uh, woken up in uh, is that uh, we've gotten the habit of organizing online conferences. And so I'm happy that uh, the counter is still ticking, but uh, for the moment, 140 participants only, also online. Uh, so I'm happy that we can combine those um, assets. Very to have to welcome so many uh, of you. I'll just. Um, say a few words about um, the book because we won't be able to uh, discuss all of the uh, the chapters here. That's maybe the disadvantage of online formats. Everything needs to be said now in two or two and a half hours, but we hope that we will have the chance uh, to organize a second uh, event uh, to discuss the other chapters. We will keep you posted if that is uh, indeed um, the case. Um, so yeah, I think, what first needs to be said is, of course, the, the background uh, of, of this uh, of the book, which is a, a rather uncomfortable and indeed uh, unsettling background. Uh, multiple global crises, uh, health crisis, an economic and financial crisis, a climate crisis, an energy crisis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are unfolding at the same time. When I came from uh, the train this morning, there is a, a big manifestation uh, gathering outside, uh, and so it's not so far away from um, where we are. So different crises developing uh, in parallel, and of course, uh, war has returned uh, to Europe, last and certainly not least. Uh, it would seem that this state of uh, permanent crisis or perma crisis is now being uh, discussed in literature uh, is one uh, that is uh, bound to stay, and this will be the environment in, in which Europe and indeed uh, the world uh, will be operating probably for uh, the next uh, few years. And so it's this unsettling reality of uh, a multi-crisis uh, multi Europe uh, that provides an essential background for this uh, year's Bilan Social de l'Union Européenne, um, which covers the years 2020, the first half of, sorry, the year 2021 and the first half of uh, 2022. And yet, and that's maybe uh, a first important message we see, or maybe thanks to, we discussed that today, uh, this crisis context we see, uh, we find in this book that uh, building on the seeds to some extent that have been sown by the previous uh, European Commission, the Juncker Commission, uh, we see that the authors in this book find that the von der Leyen Commission um, has in fact been able to pursue another ambitious uh, uh, policy agenda <clears throat> throughout uh, the past uh, year and a half, in despite the global turmoil. And what we see is that in many cases, uh, COVID-19 uh, has been uh, a catalyst for a number of new uh, and previously unthinkable uh, initiatives. Um, so very briefly, uh, I just mentioned that there's, there's an opening chapter by Federico uh, uh, who argues that uh, Russian military aggression uh, in early 2020 uh, prompted uh, the EU to respond with unprecedented steps forward uh, in terms of uh, European integration, uh, particularly in the fields of defense and energy, which goes, of course, a little bit beyond our usual scope 
of the Bidon Social, but we found it important to uh, introduce the book uh, with uh, this kind of uh, broader perspective. And at the same time, of course, Federico Fabini is certainly not a naive person. Uh, and so he also highlights the key weaknesses, some of the uh, the key uh, uh, shortcomings of the governance system, of the power structure in the EU, the financial architecture, etc., which have been further put into the spotlight uh, by this um, crisis. And he also has a very interesting discussion on how the Conference of the Future of Europe, which of course took place in part during, um, um, or the activities of which took part during uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, has begun to address some of the shortcomings. Uh, I won't go into the uh, the second chapter by David Bockhorst, of course, because we have uh, David here. It deals with um, uh, the, discuss the, the the first national recovery and resilience plans, which have been submitted in uh, 2021, their governance, uh, how they have been uh, dealt with and how relevant they are. We will get to that in a moment. The same recovery and resilience plans are discussed from a very different angle by uh, Sebastiano Sabato, Sofira Theodorovulu, both of them are here with us today. We will listen to them uh, in a moment. Uh, and they looked at these plans from the angle of uh, the socio-ecological uh, socio dimension, uh, just transition. Um, we'll get back to that topic in a moment. Then there is the chapter by uh, Slavina Spasova and Mateo Marenko. Again, both of the authors are uh, in the room here. Uh, which discusses the politics of the uh, European Commission proposal for um, a directive on improving the working conditions of people working through uh, platforms. Uh, very interesting chapter again. And they uh, describe, they assess, uh, the, or they describe uh, how the European Commission has been able to play its role as uh, a policy entrepreneur in setting the policy agenda around uh, that uh, directive. Um, similarly, there's a, a very interesting discussion about uh, the, the, the dynamics, the collaborations between the European Commission and the European Parliament, um, which was key in politicizing uh, this issue. And they conclude that um, regulating digital work is possible uh, mm -hmm. while also discussing um, uh, the extent to which EU social dialogue um, mechanisms need to be uh, reformed. And that would be uh, an interesting discussion, maybe for a second conference. Then two words on the chapter by Petra uh, de Busser, um, uh, who sort of follows up on the more positive appraisal of, uh, of the previous uh, chapter, uh, but which deals with uh, gender equality, um, gender equality policy. Um, and Petra de Busser's claim is that the, the present European Commission uh, has put gender equality uh, firmly back on uh, the European agenda um, uh, in, uh, in, 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 yeah, in a way that is uncomparable in her view compared to any previous European Commission. Whether that positive appraisal, we can share that, we will see in a moment. We'll discuss, and we have Mary Collins also in the room who will uh, discuss this with us during mm -hmm. the final part. And then there is a chapter by Angelina Atanasova and Zane Rasnaka. Uh, from ETY, uh, which deals with the rule of law uh, dismantling that's taking place uh, in Europe as we uh, speak. They notably look at Hungary uh, and Poland. Um, um, an important topic, of course, uh, which uh, rule of law backsliding, uh, which according to some is maybe the only uh, truly existing um, risk for uh, the European uh, Union at this moment. So. Uh, they raise the question whether the EU's uh, conditionality mechanisms um, could be used to discipline uh, member states <laughs> regarding the rule of law um, uh, issues to be uh, discussed and follow up on. In other words, a lot of beef uh, on the table uh, in this book for researchers, for stakeholders, policymakers, which are gathered here, who are also gathered uh, online, 180 for the moment. And so I hope, uh, Philippe, that uh, our client, the European Trade Union Institute, uh, is happy with what we have uh, produced so far. So, Philippe, the floor is yours. The, <clears throat> thank you, Bart. And, and thank you also uh, to start to uh, remember us that the, the last meeting uh, was here and uh, was the last uh, before the, the COVID. And if you, we look uh, in uh, uh, the last three years, we didn't have just one crisis, but two crises, which is really exceptional. And I think, makes sense that uh, all 
uh, approach you know, are, are speaking about a polycrisis and we have to, to uh, analyze a very yeah. complex uh, situation. Uh, but in three years, that's very uh, clear that uh, the environment uh, has changed, uh, the, the debate uh, has changed, uh, and Europe is still in, in the middle of, of the, the river, but uh, there is absolutely a different discussion that we had before. And I think that that's really uh, important. I, I would like also to, to uh, thank uh, all the, the COMPUP. Uh, because it's always a miracle to have the on time the below we were expecting just to have the english version and there is a miracle the french version <laughs> is also there as there was a, a strong flavor of french uh, in the below i think it's one of the last publication that we have the two language and that most of the people in the room are speaking french and understanding french which is different from most of the conference so that's uh, also thank you the team to and uh, it's also uh, for me uh, something uh, rather particular because, as you, you know, I, I started the Bilan when I was at the Observatoire. No, as two thirds uh, of the Bilan, I was the, the the person asking uh, the, the Observatoire to do the Bilan together with, with us. And but it's also my my last. Uh, uh, a moment that uh, I will share with Bart uh, the floor because I'm leaving uh, the institute. Uh, I, I was a few months and I finished my mandate. So it was a, a nice adventure and a nice adventure we start 22 years ago. And I think that that's exactly uh, 2000. And, and uh, once again, it's interesting because most of uh, the paper that you read now are analyzing the period from uh, 2020. And as you know, we had the Barroso period and, and that was the kind of austerity for the Bilan because they, they had nothing to say. And they tried <laughs> desperately to find something that is not desesperating, but a, a topic and then they expand. And now we are in the situation that there is too much to say. There is not enough space for all the debate that we have in different corners. Uh, and I didn't say uh, by that, that uh, all is rosy, uh, that uh, the pillar arrange everything and that we are in the best period of the uh, EU integration and social policy. But at least there is different place that we reopen all debate and uh, so uh, Marco here, including on the stability and growth pact that kind of even is disappointing so far, there is something uh, happening. But uh, as uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, in the business for a long time and I start with the single market. We remember the single market. And I would like to finish to, to give some thought for the future. And it, it, it goes rather well with what is in the French version starting page 167. It's about the open strategic autonomy and the, the single market. I think that's really interesting and perhaps some suggestion for that. The next Bilan Social that I will not be there and I cannot influence no longer. But I, I think that uh, what it was really at the center of the European integration was the, the single market. Uh, and that was really uh, uh, important. Uh, and the rest of the policies were linked to, more or less to the single market. And then and now 30 years after that they celebrate 30 years of, of the single market, I think that we have to rethink strategically a new single market that is more social, more environmental, and uh, taking in, in, into account strategic autonomy, which means, in a way, to rethink the, the globalization we are in. And I think that's really the kind of big challenge, a big uh, story, I think, that uh, is developing uh, uh, for the future. The future. Yep. So I stop here. Uh, I can speak for one and a half hour, but uh, I, I try to restrain to my five minutes, and I succeed to have six. Uh, and <laughs> I apologize, I will have uh, to leave at uh, 11.40 uh, because I have an important meeting about the statute of uh, the ETUI, which uh, was moved uh, half an hour before it should have been start at one, but start at the end with the demonstration so that I can reach the, the place. But Bart will uh, continue the sharing uh, of my session and uh, let's open the, the presentation. Thank you very much, Philippe, and thank you also for this joint adventure for the past, indeed, uh, 22 years. While we continue, we'll hear some noises, um, some noise outside. 
uh, from the manifestation. Also, thanks, Philippe, for the suggestion for the next binom. You won't be there, but something tells me that you will still be influential. <laughs> okay, so I now have the pleasure to hand over to um, Slavina. The slide is already uh, in place. And then, please, Slavina. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Philippe. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to the panel, which will be focusing on the social dimension of the recovery and resilience facility. I'm Slavina Spasova, one of the co-editors of the book, and my job is to guide you through this session. And in order to ensure the smooth flow of the session, it will be organized as uh, follows. First of all, uh, David Bockhorst will present his insightful and original chapter on how national social reforms have been steered through DUS recovery uh, plan. David Bockhorst is a research fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and at the Institute for Public Economy in the Netherlands. Then uh, to discuss his findings, we have two outstanding discussants. Uh, for a more academic point of view, we have uh, um, Amandine Crespi, who is a professor in EU studies, and she is also the deputy director of the Center for Critical Studies, uh, SEDIPOL, at Université Libre de Bruxelles. And then from a, a policymaking perspective, we, have, uh, we are very happy to have here with us uh, Luca Rossi, um, instead of unit at the European Commission's Recovery and Resilience Task Force. Afterwards, David will respond for a couple of minutes to uh, their uh, comments. And uh, afterwards, I will open the floor to all of you, to the audience here in the room, but also uh, online to those following us online. So please, uh, you could already uh, ask your questions through the chat. Don't forget that. And um, without further delay, uh, David, uh, we are all listening very carefully to you because I know that you are also going to present some updates to your chapter. Thank you for 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the invite. It's good to be here. Thanks also for allowing me to write a chapter in the book. It was uh, good fun and a very nice experience. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the EU recovery fund. Um, I'm going to first give an overview a little bit of uh, the key arguments of my chapter. All the examples are in the chapter itself, so I'll only give a brief outline. Like Slavina said, um, Bart asked me about a year ago to write this chapter. And Bart asked me something, I drop all my stuff immediately. And I, I get to work, so I did most of the work in spring uh, 2022. And afterwards, we went on with uh, researching together with my colleagues, Jonathan Zeit and Francesco Corpo and Edgar Imanis on implementation. But now we're studying implementation in the midst of another report. So the question then is, now that we're looking at payment requests of the RF, do I still agree with everything that I wrote? Um, yes. <laughs> with some nuances, yes. Sorry. And then issues for debate. And, uh, so Bart asked me, what is the most significant event in EU social policy in the first half of 2021? And my answer there is the, the adoption of the first 14 uh, recovery plans, which gives us a bit of an insight in terms of um, both, you know, what is in these plans? What is What does resilience mean? So I tried to think about sort of an overarching framework that best fits what we see in some of the plans. The plans are very big. Um, and secondly, when we look at the, the commission evaluations of the plans, it also tells us a little bit about how does this instrument work. And here I also update the chapter a bit with some of the material that has been coming out. Um, I do this against the background of a number of debates. So on the one hand, you have the debate about the socialization of the European semester, which came up in 2015. After the depressing Barroso period, slowly researchers like Bart and Jonathan started noticing a, an increase in the social direction. But this has always been contested because authors have, for example, argued that the social CSRs were still um, uh, under the shadow of more fiscally oriented CSRs. But now that we have the RF, of more fiscal resources have been made available. And the question is, you know, is this a, a, a more decisive push in, in, in the direction of social Europe? 
At the same time, we have now the recovery and resilience facility. The governance of it uh, originates from a debate that already started in 2013 when Merkel proposed reform contracts. And ever since in EU discussing sort of the balance between introducing on the one and more solidarity mechanisms, but then what is the type of conditionality that is linked to it? You see how the, the recovery and resilience facility was uh, defended depended in a very different way by Draghi than, for example, by Prime Minister Rutte in the Netherlands. And I have a long quote in the chapter where he says, you know, all this climate investment and digital investment, that's all nice and all, but you know, what I really care about is uh, harsh conditionality on competitiveness reforms. And if the commission is too lenient here, then we'll make sure that... So, you know, what is this conditionality? So the key arguments of my chapter on the governance side, uh, I argue that the key governance novelty of this instrument is the principle of performance financing. And the goal here is to harden commitment. Of <laughs> performance financing means, and you might've heard about this, uh, this systematic of introducing milestones and targets, detailed milestones and targets in the plans. And you can only get the next tranche of the funding once you've achieved all these milestones and targets within the set deadline. That is sort of the key, the key novelty. Um, I think importantly, uh, when we think about CSR implementation, uh, so CSR sorry, is the country specific recommendation of the European semester, um, that these recovery and resilience plans, the plans of the member states are very much negotiated agreements. So going back and forth, back and forth, but the commission and member states, sometimes up to 80, 90 times. Um, so very carefully negotiated. And they also therefore differ in their level of ambition and detail. It's not absolute. CSR implementation, oh, but it is, um, let me see. It's not absolute CSR implementation, but there's a lot of uh, variation in the plans. And I use a number of examples uh, where I look into this, for example, tax evasion. Um, you see that the number of countries are going much further than some of the others. When you look at, for example, Luxembourg or Ireland in their plans, you see that the ambition is actually rather low. So officially, uh, uh, all member states have been sort of given an A grade in terms of implementation of CSR. So they all got you know, flying colors. But you know, behind it, you see that the Commission has tried to push for a maximum implementation of CSRs, but the actual uh, effects of it, the actual implementation varies a lot. You can imagine that, of course, those countries that are set to receive more from the RF are also more ambitious in terms of their plans. Um, but even for those countries that are receiving more, it is not absolute CSR implementation. You do see that countries have uh, managed to establish their own red lines or sometimes even go against what the CSR recommends. And here I discuss a little bit more at length the pension reform in, in Spain, where actually the direction of the reform goes a little bit against what the CSR is uh, asking in terms of financial sustainability. Here you can see that the commission has negotiated. So they've said, well, if you're not planning to increase your retirement age, link it to life expectancy, how are you going to make sure that it still fulfills this financial And there you see that Spain, for example, wants to invest in North <laughs> Um, I do note, though, that when you look at the internal governance of these plans, they've been drafted in a rather centralized manner. Uh, it's also due to the fact that they've been basically been established in quite a rush. There was a very significant time pressure. Um, um, but uh, uh, it is important that uh, now we're, that we're moving towards the monitoring phase, this is less about sort of deliberation with one another, and it's more about contractualization. I said you only get uh, paid out if you if you implement the milestones and targets. So it's a contract, and this contract is not just a commitment of the government to introduce reforms, but it is uh, a commitment of the entire state apparatus to deliver results. So this means that social partners are also bound by this contractualization, regions, parliaments, etc. And here, of course, then it's it's, it's a disadvantage that some of these plans, not all. Are centralized by uh, the states. The Commission itself has been trying to also push for more implementation, but like I said, mm -hmm. I do note also that uh, um, um, in practice, when we when we look at monitoring of the Commission, this balance between 
the commission uh, needs in, in its monitoring. We've seen it in the stability and growth pact in the past. We've seen it elsewhere. But they always use the sort of the, 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 the discretion that is in the instrument to, for, to look for wiggle room. So even though it's contractualization, my expectation here, and this is where I will uh, discuss at the end, is that in the end, politics and negotiation will prevail also in implementation. Now, when we look at content, and here I simply <clears throat> read all the commission assessments, and I tried to look, you know, what is what is the overarching framework here? Uh, what is the direction of travel? What is what is social resilience movement? And I think it's an amplification of the ongoing shift in the social policy paradigm towards social investment. So the social investment paradigm seems to be very, very much prominent here. And the way to think about this is that the RF enables member states in their transformation towards a balance between various functions of the welfare state. In the Wellsire project that I'm working on in Florence, we distinguish between three welfare state functions, investing in stock, so that's human capital stock, uh, so education, lifelong learning, uh, et cetera. The flow function of the welfare state, meaning the life course flow, so life course transitions, moving from a uh, student into your first job, or your first child, or moving from job to job, or moving towards your retirement. Here, the state has a has a has a role to play in supporting uh, its citizens, and the buffer function, which is of course income uh, protection. And we argue that those states that are uh, uh, that sort of balance these kinds of uh, functions um, uh, are also the ones that are able to uh, buffer shocks. Um, uh, or <laughs> Um, and you do see this back in the plans where you see that governments are investing. Pretty much every plan has quite a long chapter on education, education investment, skills investments, childcare investments. Um, so it is a bit of a, you know, moving towards a balance between stock flow and buffer funds. Now, sometimes this way of looking at the welfare states at these, at these three functions is, 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 is uh, critiqued as kind of a sort of a neoliberal interpretation of, of the welfare state, something I personally disagree with. But uh, here it's also good to mention that the last element, that is not a trade-off, right? It's not that because we invest, you invest more in some of these functions that should come at a cost of uh, inclusive buffers. Uh, and here, I think also, if you look at the recovery plans, and this is uh, good news, I think, from a social perspective, you do see also quite a few examples of countries investing in adequacy, uh, buffer policies, and coverage. <laughs> think of minimum uh, pensions, minimum income uh, protection, etc. Um, interestingly, there's also some evidence, and now that we're looking at implementation, we have even more evidence that the European Commission has been pushing in the negotiations with member states, or they've been pushing member states to uh, address social adequacy issues. Here are a number of examples that have, that have sort of taken out from the various plans. Now, does the RF lead to a social investment transition? That's an open question, but here are some interesting examples that I found. So in Italy, Italy invests quite significantly in their plan in, uh, uh, in child care capacity and the logic here is not only to invest in the child from an educational perspective but also because uh, of uh, Italy still has lower female employment uh, rates than the EU average and now they were slowly moving towards a situation where <coughs> there's increasing shortages in the labor market this seems like a, a interesting investment. Croatia then here you see this link, one of the RF novelties to link investment with reforms. And Croatia has invested in childcare, but it was also linked to a reform that introduces a legal entitlement to pre-primary education, which is something that perhaps is missing on the How much do I have? Six. 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 Good. Latvia is perhaps uh, is also a case I want to draw your attention to. Uh, this is where we see this influence of the Commission on social uh, on social policy. A very interesting case because Latvia has a very small uh, welfare state and it's quite a liberal regime. And here we see that the Commission in negotiations has also been pushing the Latvians to address social adequacy issues. And here you see in their plans, for example, that there's an index minimum income provisions. Spain is focusing on gender, for example, but also uh, they introduced their labor market uh, law, and we see the first results coming uh, out of that an increase in permanent contracts among uh, young um, Portugal left-wing government uh, uh, addresses social issues to a significant extent. 
these are just some of the examples. I have an analysis in the chapter where, where I discuss a little bit more. Maybe. Okay, so. Slides. And then the question is, I think I sent you the wrong version of that. <laughs> and the unsafe, unsafe version. Okay. Well, in any case, I know what I want to say. So let's listen. So the question that becomes do I still agree with myself now that we're looking more towards uh, uh, into monitoring? Um, on content, yes. I think uh, um, uh, this is indeed uh, still, we are seeing a social investment transition in many of these plans. Um, now that more studies are coming out that are looking more in depth into specific countries, you do see also some gaps. Uh, interesting um, uh, Italy, where indeed you see a lot of infrastructure investments, but sometimes these are not always followed up by like deep reform, for example, in the area of uh, of vocational and educational training, but also in the area of childcare. Something that uh, it's also important to understand and that we're now seeing more and more as an issue when we look at digitalization is the fact that RF investment is capital investment, not current expenditure. And what does that mean? Think again of childcare, you can invest in the building, but not in the teachers. Now, this is an issue, both from the perspective of barriers to implementation. You see that small municipalities are having sometimes difficulty with uh, uh, ensuring that they also, that their domestic, so that their local policies of, you know, buying teachers matches the aims of the RF. And you see, that, for example, in the south of Italy, they're not, uh, not all municipalities, smaller municipalities can obtain these grants. But it's also an obstacle if we think about, you know, does this really to, to a deep transition, you know, um, simply put, you can give a teacher an iPad with the RF, but if their salary is still low, it doesn't ensure that we have better education. Um, so ensuring the alignment of domestic and local uh, fiscal policy, most of all, with, uh, with RF funding, that's uh, to ensure like a real transition, that is the challenge here. On governance, uh, the picture is more nuanced, yeah. No, I, I slides, apologies. Um, I do think we see a number of virtues, sort of policy virtues coming from this governance arrangement of, of uh, the IRA. You see that it leads to more efficiency, in the sense that many member states are saying, well, we were planning these, these reforms anyway. It's not new in that sense, but the fact that they're now linked to these payment requests and that they have a very clear deadline, it helps us for faster implementation. So it's more efficient. There's also an element of discipline. If you're a small country that is set to receive a lot of funding over every six months to, in order to meet these payment requests, and you don't want to be the last person in the administration not to deliver, which ri might risk your country losing out on billions. So that creates an enormous pressure and discipline within administrations uh, to deliver and to be aligned. There's also an element of accountability here. So what we're hearing back from interviews with member state officials is that they're saying that, you know, perhaps politicians before the RF were able to promise all sorts of things, but now that it's been put in a contract, now that it is concrete, everyone, the public, journalists, everyone can follow what has to be delivered uh, uh, and when. So that creates an element of accountability. Now, when I say the picture is more nuanced, is that my expectation was that the European Commission would also lose their leeway in, in, their, in their monitoring style. Um, and in my chapter, I argue, you know, when they have a significant, uh, significant subset of CSRs need to be implemented, there's a lot of leeway in how to interpret that. So maybe in the monitoring phase, they will also use this leeway. For example, the Commission looks at whether things are satisfactorily fulfilled. What I'm seeing in practice now in the, in the, there's some seats here in front. What I'm seeing in practice now is that there is a little bit more rigidity in the RF than we had expected, which is two aspects. On the one hand, there's a very high information load, primarily because there are sort of these principles such as do no significant harm energy efficiency directive, that is requiring a lot of information from implementation units, but, that's within the RF uh, 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 instrument, but it's also the style of, gov of, of monitoring of the commission that many member states are now uh, seeing as very rigid. And if you have an instrument that has a very high 
uh, level of detail, ex ante detail. And these plans contain hundreds of pages with very detailed milestones, in some cases, not in all cases. And you combine it with quite a rigid monitoring style, the risk is that you see implementation on paper rather than implementation in practice. And here, what we're hearing back from uh, interviews from member state officials is that they're saying that the European Commission right now is more worried about European Court of Auditor reports who are even driving this process further towards rigidity than uh, uh, working with member states to ensure that actually it's, it's the goals that count, it's the quality that counts, not the metrics that counts. So I'm, I'm going to my conclusions. So this is my worry, which I had not expected when I when I was writing my chapter, when I was thinking that it might be more, more than this. So my conclusions are not slight. So my conclusions are twofold. <laughs> Uh, my conclusions are twofold. On the one hand, uh, yes, we see, we're seeing an, a social investment transition uh, 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 within the, in these member states' plans, but the challenge here is to make sure that the RF aligns with domestic fiscal policy. Uh, and second, in terms of governance, we're seeing a number of virtues here, uh, policy virtues in terms of accountability and efficiency and discipline in the policy process. Um, and we're also seeing some uh, 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 some uh, uh, clear examples where centralization of the plans, the drafting of the plans is creating issues, but also where it's good, uh, we're seeing examples where actually in the, in, the, in the rotation process, social partners are actually involved. It was just in the drafting of the plans because of the rush that they were. And finally, the challenge in the, on the governance side is uh, what I mentioned is to ensure that the goals, that the policy goals and the quality of implementation is the key metric that we're looking at that uh, uh, an auditor view is not the holy grail of effectiveness thank you very much david for this comprehensive and at the same time very <laughs> But there's still some place here for those uh, standing or sitting on tables and now i have the floor to amanda for her comments and things Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to um, discuss the important research conducted by um, OZ and, and ETUI. And um, thank you uh, very much uh, for um, this excellent chapter. I think it's uh, extremely useful to understand what's going on in this complex um, constellation the RF and with social investment, uh, but also to understand the underpinning politics. Um, and I'll focus on that uh, a lot since you wanted an academic point of view here. Um, and I think it's also very useful to give an overview of what we may expect in the coming years in terms of the problems that are coming in a way uh, in terms of efficiency implementation, but also, and I point this out as well, political conflict. Um, possibly. So my remarks will deal with those three interrelated aspects, policy issue, the politics, uh, but also the broader lessons uh, in terms of what we learn from this about the EU as a multi-level uh, polity. So first of all, concerning uh, policy aspects, um, what I find really fascinating is that the, the chapter, uh, the topic relies on a fundamental paradox. Um, in contrast with what we have for the greening and the digitalization of the economy, we have no formal conditionality for social policy, right? And yet, we seem to detect very clearly a kind of implicit social earmarking with important levels, uh, estimated at around 30% in average, sometimes even more, uh, in the national plans. So, um, there's a little footnote in the chapter about this, but I'd be really interested to know just a little bit more about this, David. Can you tell us how can we explain this? So first of all, how come there was no agreement in the council for a social policy uh, formal conditionality being included in the RAF? Um, and secondly, how come it still materializes in practice? Right. Then my second question relates to the existing or perhaps non-existing connection with um, social policy expenditure and those green and digital expenditure on the other hand. And in the chapter, you mentioned that 
uh, it can be very challenging to categorize expenditure, right? Because some expenditure will be hybrid. So what do you do? Is that green? Is that digital? Is that social? What do you do? But another way to think about this would be precisely to consider that this would be very fruitful to have more hybrid expenditure. Um, so why not try to assess or to uh, yeah, detect and trace um, those types of expenditure that seek precisely not to address those three areas in silos, but precisely to address those new problems that are at the intersection of those areas in a just transition perspective, for instance. Um, so I'd be interested to know, does the European Commission look at this in a way or another? Um, and uh, how can we think about measures that would serve to address social justice and, um, for instance, the ecological uh, transition or um, the digital technological um, developments together? I now move on to the political aspects of all this, uh, which are um, just as fascinating as the policy aspects. And I think the chapter raises extremely important findings and reflections, although a bit more emphasis is put on efficiency, but still uh, regarding democratic aspects. And I'd like to push a little bit further here. So we can indeed uh, talk about the contract, but isn't the contract dangerously democratically flawed when we look at, as the chapter points out, the, of course, highly differentiated manner, but across the board, fairly low manner in, in which um, national uh, parliaments in particular, I would argue, uh, have been involved. Um, not only, well, now down the line, they will have to agree on the reforms, but the contract has been sealed already most of the time without them. Uh, deliberating fully and, and deeply and agreeing on, on the plans. Uh, so again, highly differentiated across the member states, uh, but uh, as an overall uh, assessment. And I think it's all good in a way, as long as we are now in a relatively, I would say, consensual dynamic where everybody's pushing in the same direction, which is a centrist social investment agenda. But one day it may be different. And so how do we make sure that there's um, sufficient uh, parliamentary uh, control, in fact, and accountability on the multi-level executive machinery? And so now very clearly the commission doesn't have the power to dictate member states how they make the plan and how they deal with this democratically. But is there then a way to involve the European parliament much more formally with a formal and fully effective uh, power of control. After all, these are very large amounts of fiscal resources that are spent here from European taxpayers. And I think it would make very much sense if the European Parliament, which has also, I would say, although of course national conflicts and, and conflict lines can play a lot, but also perhaps more distance from domestic arenas as, as such. Um, all right, and finally, last set of remarks. Um, in section one, especially, I think the chapter shows very well that the political influence, and that doesn't really come as a surprise. We've seen this before with the European semester. The political influence uh, is much greater on smaller countries, especially those who um, are more fragile uh, from an economic point of view. And in this particular instance, those who receive much larger amounts of money in terms of their, in proportion of their GDP. And those countries happen to be in the Southern and in the uh, Eastern peripheries. Um, so we have this continuous asymmetry going on. Um, and this is marked for, far from new, uh, I repeat. And perhaps it's very naive to believe that it could be another way, I don't know. But still, I tend to think that this undermines the legitimacy of the union. Um, for many theorists, and especially the intergovernmentalists, um, theorists of European integration, if there's one basic uh, duty that the union has, is to prevent domination on powerful states over less powerful states. 
And it's especially the role of the supranational institutions such as the European, the European Commission to mediate and alleviate uh, those uh, power relations that are inevitable and unavoidable um, between states. So in a conclusion, um, you write David, money buys power, um, could be an alternative title for the chapter, perhaps. <laughs> um, this is a very simple realpolitik uh, recognition, um, but this could backlash big time, I think, when a time to assess implementation comes. Uh, and, you know, we've heard stories before mm -hmm. about Juncker saying you can't do this and this and that uh, with France because it's France and it turned out very bad politically at the time. And I think this could be the case uh, again. And um, with this, I finish and uh, thanks again for the discussion. Excellent. Many thanks. I give the floor to uh, Luca Rossi for his comment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I'll try to uh, basically update you all a bit from uh, on what has happened meanwhile. Because, uh, the study is based, the chapter is based on uh, 14, uh, 14 plans. Uh, of course, uh, this is a fast moving uh, environment. So we are not uh, at 14 any longer. We are not even at 27 any longer. We are at 29 now because we have already assessed the first two modifications of the 27, the first 27. <laughs> All 27 national plans. So we have moved quite uh, quite a bit. All of them uh, have uh, been assessed. Uh, there is one <laughs> which is a modification requested by by Finland. And uh, then the implementation has uh, started being being uh, unrolled, rolled out, and we have uh, spent already. We have disbursed already 142 billion euros uh, to, to to member states. Uh, 56, around 56 uh, are uh, pre-financing, so those uh, that come immediately after the approval of the plan by, by council, but there are uh, more than 80 billion which have been paid uh, after member states have uh, uh, here, here, and not only here, uh, after having been checked thoroughly by, by the commission, they have proven that they have uh, implemented all the necessary step, steps to get uh, 86 billion. And as we speak, we are assessing another 11 payment requests, which account for uh, around uh, 34 billion euros. So uh, it, it is a fast moving, uh, a fast moving uh, machine. Um, so, <clears throat> what? How do these? Uh, I'll speak about 26 plans because the the Hungarian one uh, is uh, still being categorized in the policy areas that uh, that we have uh, on. Uh, on our so-called RF scoreboard, which is a, a website in the, the RF page of the Commission, in which you can see uh, the update on the implementation of the uh, of the facility almost real time, and also where money uh, is uh, is spent. So, uh, of the entirety of the facility, as Amandine was saying, 20, 28% is uh, allocated to uh, social measures, which uh, it is indeed uh, quite remarkable, counting, uh, considering that there is no 20% uh, uh, threshold as for digital, no 37% uh, threshold as for, for green. It's probably a reflection because uh, of what uh, David was saying earlier of the socialization of, of the semester, because this comes largely from addressing past, uh, past uh, CSRs. Um, so we go. We said it's twenty eight percent. It's not a picture which is uniform across the union. It, it goes from, uh, as also uh, highlighted in the chapter, from a tiny social portion of the plan in, in Denmark, which is only around uh, three percent, to uh, the biggest spender on social issues, uh, which is Portugal, with almost forty four percent of the costs of its plan dedicated to, to social measures. Uh, we see exactly what, uh, what David was saying. So a large amount of investment in education and early, early childcare. It, it accounts for around 33%. We also see something which I haven't seen necessarily in the chapter, which is a, a almost another third of, uh, of the social cost being spent uh, on healthcare and long-term long care with uh, 
And it's not only about the investments because it, it's another area of healthcare uh, in, in which uh, there is a good balance between investment uh, and, and reform. We have around uh, 155 investments, but we also have uh, more than 80 reforms uh, in, in the plans uh, about investment. And, and there are reforms that uh, uh, are not trivial. We have the, the reform uh, in, uh, in Ireland uh, about uh, uh, changing the contract for uh, doctors uh, practicing in, in hospitals. We have uh, a reform in Austria about uh, primary care, and we have primary care uh, reform in a uh, large, large number of, of member states, also member states where, these, uh, uh, the, where the social state was a bit less developed. And uh, we see uh, moving away from institutionalization and, uh, and moving closer to, to the final users of uh, of healthcare service in many many states, and this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we consider very very uh, important. So I, I was a bit curious why this is uh, less reflected in the chapter as uh, as compared uh, to to other policy areas, and also about how you would uh, qualify in your qualification of social expenditures, these uh, expenditures uh, on, uh, on healthcare. Would there be better policies, these ones, or uh, how would they fit? Then there, there, there is the third, uh, the third area uh, is uh, uh, modernization of, uh, of uh, labor uh, market institutions and uh, uh, adult learning, which uh, takes the lion's share of these uh, for uh, which together account for around 28 billion uh, billion another element that uh, i would like to add to the picture which is a very interesting picture which is painted uh, in, in the chapter of the book is that on uh, gender equality uh, gender equality was not uh, a formal assessment uh, a formal criterion for assessing the plans. Uh, I've uh, heard with uh, pleasure someone uh, saying that uh, it has come to the center stage of uh, the Line Commission. Uh, we are very happy about that. And, and it has uh, come, uh, I would not say to the center stage, but it has been an important consideration uh, for many member states uh, in, uh, in drafting uh, their, their plans, going uh, to the uh, extreme, uh, positive extreme, of course, of Spain having uh, expressly streamlined gender equality consideration in all measures of, of its plan. And uh, we're talking about the Spanish plan. Not, we're not talking about a plan uh, of a few hundred million euros. Uh, one of the biggest plans in, uh, in, in Europe. And in, in Europe, we see gender uh, equality considerations in, uh, in measures in all six pillars. Uh, we have these uh, division in pillars uh, of the of pillars. We have measures with the potential effect on uh, on gender on, on gender equality. So this is uh, another aspect which uh, which I, I wanted to highlight uh, in addition to uh, what was uh, said uh, what was said already. Um, maybe I just quickly move to um, some of the considerations that that were made. Uh, there by by colleagues uh, here, uh, starting from uh, the uh, rigidity in, in implementation. Uh, the, it's true that there is uh, some flexibility in the regulation. Uh, that you have identified at least two important points, and uh, the one on uh, a substantial subset uh, of CSRs also transpires from, uh, uh, from from the chapter where you analyze how many. Uh, CSRs have been uh, maybe left unaddressed or marginally addressed by, by, by some member states. Uh, one is also to take into account that uh, not uh, uh, RF plans uh, are, are equal in terms, uh, uh, not in absolute terms, but even more importantly, not in relative terms. So go from plans uh, accounting for 0.3% of uh, the beneficiary member state to plans accounting for uh, more than 7% uh, of, of the annual GDP. So uh, it's a quite, a, quite a, a, broad, uh, a broad array. Of course, this also means that the firepower uh, of the plans to solve the uh, long-standing challenges of the member states is, is not equal for, for, for member states. So that is one of the considerations that, uh, that was uh, 
that the Commission had in mind and the Council had in mind when assessing when assessing the plan. The second element for um, for the uh, for flexibility is indeed that the regulation provides that to receive money, member states have to prove that they have satisfactory fulfillment the uh, relevant milestones, and, and which points to the possibility of a non literal fulfillment on the word by word, comma by comma. That's, I would say, natural because otherwise. Uh, the money would be would be the worst ever. It's almost impossible to prove that uh, to a T uh, everything has been done uh, perfectly. Uh, I, I wonder whether the um, member states that complain uh, or the member states official who complain about the validity of the commission are also those that you quote on page twenty eight of the paper uh, asking for a break mechanism, and uh, they think that the commission was too lenient. And so I, I wonder whether there is not a bit of uh, or, or, if I may say so, uh, about uh, whether we are too rigid or not enough rigid in, in assessing the plan, or whether uh, someone is afraid that we are not enough rigid uh, in, in assessing in assessing the the plan. Uh, the, the plans. Uh, I also hear the concern about uh, about ECA, uh, about the Commission being uh, driven by by ECA reports. Uh, on that, I would just remind all of us that ECA is not there to, to annoy European institutions and members. ECA is there to ensure that European taxpayers' money is spent in a way that prevents fraud, corruption, and waste of money. And so we should pay close attention to what ECA tells us could constitute a waste or a waste of EU money because. I don't think that the best way to have a, another uh, instrument uh, like uh, like DRF is uh, wasting the money uh, of DRF uh, it, itself or giving ammunition to anybody to say that uh, that money has been, has been wasted or not uh, not well spent. Then, uh, uh, conscious of time, I, I just wanted to cover one last point that uh, Amandina has raised, uh, which is whether. Uh, we took into account the uh, complementarity of certain measures that cover cover more than a, than a policy area. This is one of the feature of, features of the RF itself. It uh, always uh, speaks about uh, complementarity. There, there are these three pillars, but the uh, RF uh, uh, explicitly speaks uh, about the, the regulation itself uh, about measures covering more than one pillar, and so much so that it, in our scope, in, in this instrument. We categorize all measures under two policy areas and possibly under two policy areas falling uh, in different pillars. So not, uh, not two measures covering uh, uh, policy areas in the green pillar, but rather uh, policy measures uh, covering uh, the social pillar and, and the green pillar. The, the classical example is uh, for example uh, for uh, is the um, energy efficiency of uh, buildings that are used for uh, childcare facilities. So that, of course, improves uh, uh, the quality uh, of uh, childcare facilities, but addresses uh, also uh, a green uh, a green consideration, which is uh, uh, energy energy efficiency. And, and we have uh, really a huge, huge, huge uh, array of measures uh, in this uh, in this program. The nearest are, of course, those. Uh, using digital technologies to, to ensure uh, energy efficiency, which uh, contribute to the digital transition, like smart metering is a classical example, address both digital transition and the, the greening of, uh, of the economy and society. Maybe I stop here. Do yes. You time to yeah. Many thanks, Luca. Extremely insightful. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, uh please pick up some of them i personally will be very interested in uh, knowing a bit more um your opinion on this democracy um dimension uh as i read your chapter i agree it's uh, not uh, well developed there and then also this how um the, uh, how how would you classify the healthcare and the long term care investments in the uh, in the definition of social investment? Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, but still, uh, <laughs> out of my interest, please pick up the phones with me. So many thanks for the comments and, and your comments are all well taken and they're relevant. Um, I will try to pick up on some of them. Amandine, first, there are no social quota, in the, uh, even though they are for, uh, for climate and for digital. I do not think it's a, an issue per se, because more than half of the CSRs uh, are uh, addressed to social issues. Um, and sometimes it's also the reform side that actually has the real impact, like this legal entitlements that I that I mentioned, rather than uh, rather than the spending side. And we could also ask ourselves whether it's necessary that Denmark invests heavily in its welfare state, so as others uh, might need it more. But we do see, you know, even though there's no quota, we do see, for example, this European Pillar of Social Rights scoreboard in the in the plans that sort of reflects, you know, where's the gaps. And we see also agency of the commission where they've tried to steer uh, member states towards the addressing these gap analysis. And I think the issue of childcare is a really, really interesting one here. Um, and and you know same goes for social spending. Indeed, it's about 150 billion. But you double count sometimes is investments in the digitalization of education. Is it social or is it digital? These semantic discussions uh, for me. Um, for me, what really matters is how you try to ensure that there's coherence between the investments and the reforms to ensure a lasting impact. The element of politics and legitimacy is a very very difficult one. Um, I do think so. This is why actually initially I was quite fearful for an RF mechanism because it is indeed a hardening of conditionality that is uh, that uh, is trying to or that the EU is trying to achieve with this instrument. I've myself become slightly more optimistic because of the social economic context. It's about mostly this is about building welfare state functions rather than really trimming them down as we were doing in, in or as the EU was doing in 2012, 2013. So any legitimacy discussion should be seen in that context, but that doesn't involve uh, the issues for you. Indeed, the like I mentioned, one of the one of the concerns is the rather centralized manner in which these have been drafted. You should also understand that. These kinds of uh, rather technical uh, uh, um, exercises are quite difficult for parliaments. So in the Netherlands, they tried, right? The, the, the Dutch uh, civil service gave a big list and they asked parliament, okay, trim it down, show me what your priorities are. It was a general debate and politicians couldn't agree uh, on such a prioritization. It's quite hard, um, but in implementation, they should have, uh, they should have a vote. You to try to see uh, uh, whether there is more than just uh, rubber stamping at the end. Mm -hmm. And there, here, there's a role for social scientists as well. I mean, we're now, like I said, we're looking at implementation. I'm trying to search for these kinds of examples. What I'm hearing back from civil servants in member states as well. Our parliaments are telling us to be more ambitious and to go even faster. But I'm searching for, you know, where is the, where do we see that it's actually becoming a bit uh, difficult and examples here, for example, the pension reform in Belgium, which we're seeing these days uh, as quite controversial, this element of financial sustainability, then we have to go back to the negotiating table. So that's something for us to look into. Where is this, you know, how does this uh, relate to rigidities? We have the same in the Netherlands where there's a pension reform being passed and the Senate might need more time here. So these de these deadlines they might do in, they might impact indeed the, the process. I, I also think for social scientists it's important to be quite clear in how much power is uh, concentrated in these types of mechanism. And uh, well, I have a paper coming out with Francesco Corti where we look at hierarchical governance in the RF be coming out soon, where we it's it's a similar argument. We say the Commission has indeed their influence on member states has uh, been enhanced quite significantly, but member states do are able to protect red lines. It is it, in the end, ultimately, it's the member states themselves that are drafting these plans, even when it's European norms and CSRs that are steering the process. And other but it's important to be clear about uh, the, the, the level of power and to be clear about the, the potential rigidities uh, that I mentioned, because this is uh, is instrument uh, goes into sensitive areas where the EU doesn't have a whole lot of competence, such as labor markets, such as pensions. We should also be wary by uh, overly rigid monitoring because of the legitimacy issues. And we should think about what is effective commissionality. And the argument here is that we're not there yet in that discussion. 
you mentioned asymmetry indeed uh, i think the example i give most of all in my in my chapter is germany which has not addressed more than half of csrs uh, in their plan and that also makes sense because they send it in uh, just before the elections um, <laughs> Then, Luca, you mentioned healthcare, and that is indeed the poor. So, I'm a social investment scholar, and healthcare is indeed a little bit of a blind spot with this that we should work on, and that we're also aware of and are having discussions amongst ourselves like, how do we include this? Mm -hmm. When this, when it comes to this chapter, I was looking at it from the perspective of this Rutte quote, right? The, you know, we want competitiveness enhancing reforms, and we want debt sustainability. And I thought, you know, what does social resilience mean in that aspect? And therefore, I look more at the type of employment uh, related issues. But it's true that the healthcare is very much in there. Uh, and I hope uh, maybe in the next book, someone can write a chapter about healthcare, <laughs> investment, <laughs> and resilience. Uh, and long term care. Exactly. It's very and, important. Uh, long term care. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, uh, if we think about it conceptually, so I mentioned those three functions of the welfare state. They're not absolute function it's a way of thinking about the welfare state like child care is a way it is it has a, is a speaks to the flow function of the of the welfare states uh, life course transitions but good child care systems are also have educational value right it's stock it's, similarly we could think about uh, health care as being both a type of buffer policy but also you know good like a social investment perspective more preventive uh, a risk risk prevention approach in healthcare we see more of speaking to the flow function uh, i do see that, 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 that there are some advantages here in the conceptual framework that we should think about and then rigidity i mean in monitoring i think so the commission has always and this is what i tried to allude to in my in my starting slide the commission has always had to balance between various expectations it's true for the stp it was true for the semester it is true for the rrf and whereas some more hawkish countries have certain expectations of what this RF will deliver, others might have uh, different expectations. And the Commission has a difficult job mm -hmm. balancing. My job is not to, to, to think about you know, whom you should talk to here, but my job is to think about what is effective uh, in style. And of course, the Court of Auditor has its role to see if money is well spent. And that's their role, and they stick very closely to their mandate and they should. My argument here is that they are not the holy grail of what we should perceive of as effective, mm -hmm. especially if we have lots of these quantitative targets at the end, you know, the real difficult deadline, like, oh, 25, 26. And we might see that not all of these will be fully implemented, not all the targets will be achieved, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And then it will be very easy for the court auditors to have with a pure all of you to look at it and to say, well, then it has failed. Right? But what you want to try to uh, achieve, especially when you mix uh, reforms and investments, is meaningful progress in transitions, which is much more a qualitative term, much harder to quantify. But it's the thing that you want to achieve with an instrument like that. Uh, um, so um, it is, again, on one side, the role of close. Uh, social scientists to think about how does that what does meaningful change look like in the RF, but also uh, um, uh, to try to think about what type of conditionality most conducive through that. And uh, uh, when I he do hear member states pushing back, I'm saying, "Well, we're losing, we're losing the ownership of the process." But also because of the high information loads, small companies, NGOs, etc., are not responding to our tenders. Then I do think there's there's a problem. Thank you very much, David. And now the floor is yours to the audience in the room. And then Bart will uh, present some questions from the chat. So please feel free to ask your question. No questions from, from the audience? Yes, please. Could you please present yourself? Dr. Shilenko from the European Trade Union Confederation. Uh, thank you for this. Great uh, analysis of the area, very, very interesting and uh, precise. I have just uh, a question to um, David, but also probably for the rest of the panel. This is concerning, um, on one end, the, the governance, uh, because, you know, the RRF is taken as a, a an example, a good example to reshape the new economic governance, repeating the issue of the plan, national plans, and then the implementation through targets, etc. 
uh, don't you see the risk that without the money behind that is sort of incentives of the member states to cooperate with the commission all the exercise can result in uh, a negotiation where the commission and you in general is the counterpart of the member states uh, with the huge risks that uh, the eu is perceived as only as the bad cop and not as a, a real partner so outside the uh, possibility to finance investments with new fresh money of the EU, the risk is that this model may not fit with uh, with the future. I mean, uh, necessity. I don't know if you have an opinion on that because it's one of the main uh, debates. And okay. social measures, uh, I have to say uh, that I'm more, let's say, in line with uh, David's conclusions because uh, we made the investigation with our members. It's evident that there is no perception of the of what are the social objectives of the plans very clearly said i mean uh, there are some measures that can be then classified social or not but there is no idea of what this is the objective and how the social objective stays in this plan and uh and how this is measured and also the the quantity of money allocated to social money we have uh, a different assessment is a uh, yeah, very full report that's that uh but i think the david's uh, analysis i mean raises the right questions in these regards Many thanks. If there are no other questions in the room, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, please, first the lady behind, and then I will give you the floor. Uh, you, yes, please. Yes. Um, it's a question that follows a little bit on, on, on the previous one. I'm Tov from Melkebeke from G. And um, it goes also on the assessment that was made by, by Ms. Kristen on the different speed and the different. Um, yeah, the balance between the bigger member states and the smaller ones and the Italian Commission uh, regarding also the funding. I was wondering, and because I also think it's a big risk for solidarity in the EU and, and also legitimacy in, in small member states, I was wondering if you see any mechanisms or um, yeah, points of improvement that are possible for, for example, the sovereignty fund, <laughs> where they are now talking about, or maybe a next generation EU or something. Are there improvements? Possible ways of improvement. Thank you. Um, please, your question. Um, hello, I'm uh, Frank Van Eschot from uh, Counterbalance. Um, uh, two remarks. Actually, we are we are ourselves. We have a, a network of organizations that follow the national recovery plans in, in seven countries and also on the EU level. And one of the things that has slightly been touched, but I think is really important, is that. In many places, there is a really important lack of of capacity, state capacity, also at local authorities, etc., to deal with this funding. It's not a uh, hazard that we are. It's not a, a coincidence that we're not talk, now talking about that there's so much money still left. It's because there is a very big difficulty of digesting all this money coming in and doing really sensible stuff with this. And a person. Another comment I would like to make, and maybe this goes a bit in the direction what um, Mr. before was saying. Um, you were praising the, the Spanish recovery plan for its gender uh, streamline, main streamlining, but our member in in um, in Spain exactly criticized um, this part of the plan uh, in Spain because what is actually happening uh, is that the, the care economy and healthcare sector is also through public-private partnerships is being further privatized and it has a detrimental effect on sectors that are where women have a very important role. I think that we also like, yes, there has been this percentage, but how we see this with reality and change on the ground for having a, a real recovery. Um, we know that the care was so important. It's no coincidence that yeah. people are 10,000 trading outside exactly for more jobs in the care sector. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. One last question from the audience. I can't take more. Because thank, you very, from the, thank, thank you very much, Mary Collins from the European Women's Lobby. That was really um, very, very interesting. And I just want to come back to the role of NGOs and the difficulty of engaging in the process. And you said it was a rushed um, exercise. I would say it was fast and furious, and it was really hard to follow with the result 
that we're kind of running after the, the station. And I'm not surprised that in Portugal, it's 40% investment in the social area because it was a good consultation. And it was um, uh, you know, set up right at the very beginning before the plan was even drafted. For other countries, we haven't been able to do that. But what we're seeing now in the sector is that these big other programs with money, we've been kind of asked to this word regrant. So actually um, through big organizations, NGO at European level, to regrant to organizations at national level, in particular fees. For example, the Daphne program, which looks at violence against women, children, and young people, rather than uh, in the past, and when I say the past, it was up to last year, there were specific um, projects and partnerships. But now it's going through um, bigger organizations to actually fund on the ground. So we're becoming brokers in a way. So I just wanted to see how would, what do you think about that? It's obviously going to change the mission of the organizations themselves, but in terms of, is it a kind of on the sidelines again, on the margins, and how is it going to kind of come in, be articulated with all the rest of the big stuff that's going on? Thank you, Bart. Yeah, I'll bring in a few quick questions from the, uh, from the, online participants, and then you'll have to be very selective, I think, in your in your responses. So Torben Fisher, very much like your intervention, David, and he says um, that your buffer function corresponds to a classic understanding of social protection policies. To what extent does it make sense analytically if we subsume all functions, protection, buffer, and investment under the label of social investment? Uh, Amana Ferro, uh, and this would take a separate conference, I think. So maybe <laughs> let's see. Amana Ferro from Ergo uh, says um, a lot of what is considered as social expenditure is in fact dedicated to employment, skills, jobs, which may point to um, neoliberal policies rather than social policies. Maria Petmisudo says, don't forget that the CSRs are formulated um, very broadly, in a very broad way allowing very different interpretations and hence triggering a variety of responses. And then uh, there is a final, yes, be very selective indeed, Edwin Hercock uh, from Sweden. Um, there's a, a very interesting development, which I won't read, but he says that the Rutte, the Rutte quotation, which he gave is a shocker, still very much 1990s thinking. Are there any reasons to be cheerful when it comes to the intergovernmental bodies? <laughs> Sorry, because afterwards I'll close the session. David, uh, you've been, we've been providing here feedback on the implementation of the RF. What I would like you to provide as a last word, so we close the debate, a uh, feed forward in the context that we've been discussing yesterday, you know, with <laughs> the more general form of the economic reform of uh, the Thank you. Thank you. So there's a lot there to unpack. I will, I will be selective on three points. There was a, so Marco, you mentioned the stability and growth pact. So this is also the future question. And I'll take your, and indeed, you see that the role of the commission has changed a little bit from the auditor that comes in to check the books once per year to a type of what we call uh, perhaps a consultant or an investor, some uh, like a body that wants uh, to, to uh, negotiate with you about your growth strategy, but also bring action back to operationalized targets. And you see that with the SGP form, they also want to sort of move that role. And that opens possibilities. I think I, I will stay away from the technicalities, but in how we think about the the issue of debt sustainability, and there are many ways to achieve that sustainability. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and good social investment policies can also can also um, uh, lead to this, that sustainability. I do think um, about the role of bad cop. Um, uh, you, you see that they try to steer away from this bad cop role, and uh, and I do agree with you that if there's not the carrot, then uh, the, the the power of these instruments might be less. Therefore, I think. That wise to think about how the RF might play a role in the future of the MFF. Mm -hmm. So personally, I'm not in favor of a permanent RF because I do not see it as kind of a fiscal capacity. You know, sure, it's not a shock absorber. It's a, an instrument to support long-term transitions, just like the MFF. For me, it would make sense to see if you can merge the two and then you can discuss about how big it should be or small and how it should be financed, but that's a different question. 
The MFF and the RF are both about long-term transitions in the area of climate and social. Uh, we should think about how to, to, to uh, merge those, how to think about how to incorporate elements of the RF that are working into the MFF and then link them to, to, to CSRs uh, in order to keep, this, to keep the good sides of this structure and prevent indeed going back to a bad cop situation. Um, and there was a question about, you know, these big member states, they don't deliver uh, indeed on these, uh, 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 or they deliver much less. I think for the future, we should think about how we define additionality, which is now a very narrowly defined in the current uh, MFF, but sorry, uh, current RRF. Um, I think if we want to continue with these types of mechanisms, uh, the, the added value is much lower. simply replace their nationally pre-existing funding with EU funding. So how we define additionality, the, the fact that it's actually new uh, or cross-border even, th those might be more uh, news uh, uh, forward. Um, and then indeed, in terms of state capacity, the RF have not, has not broken the holy grail out of the conundrum of the NFS. You do see member states have uh, put uh, administrative reforms at the start of their of their plans to, to try and address these issues. You see in Italy, they've hired all sorts of external experts to try and help smaller municipalities in obtaining the funding. But the barriers uh, and the high uh, administrative load are indeed uh, barriers to, to implementation. And a country like Italy has uh, not been able to move spend all the money last year and will probably also not make all the targets. Um, I don't have a lot of knowledge about the NGOs, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps we can talk about it. And then as an academic, I'd like to pick up also with, with this criticism of Torben. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, that I'll, I'll do it as short as I can, but I do mm -hmm. think that social investment in their conceptualization and then and the way it's been discussed, I don't think it makes much sense to say, well, this is social investment and that is social protection as if there is sort of a trade-off I don't it's too long it has been discussed as a trade-off between the two whereas what you would really want to see is sort of the complementary functions uh, uh, and, and I th that is what we're trying to look for both in our conceptualization and in the way we study resilient welfare states it is about inclusivity of partners uh, that matter just as much as as uh, gender balanced flows and uh, lifelong uh, human capital investment and it is also it is about the, the 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 way of thinking about sustainability in the end. It's on the one there's the goal of equity equality, but also sustainability. Where for a long time this has been seen as trade off. And eh? Merkel had the famous quote: "Europe has only seven percent world population, twenty five percent of its GDP, fifty percent of its social spending. So we're not competitive. So let's cut. So you know the idea was let's cut in the social side in order to keep it sustainable." And nowadays, it's much more about balancing uh, uh, welfare state functions, which is happening uh, on the back of rising employment. Rising employment does require a different welfare state setup, much more, uh, much more services based, like childcare. I disagree also that that's neoliberal. This is what, what uh, uh, will lead to more resilient welfare states, and that's a, a complementary uh, aspect. But we have to think about that in Yes. Thank you very much to you, David, to Amandine and Luca. Excellent. It was a very intensive and very interesting session. Please, those online, stay tuned for the next session on eco-social policies in the RRF. Uh, we have three minutes break, and thanks to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started again. I think we are live also, Maria, right? Yeah, we are good to go. So, um, the good news is that we had a great discussion this morning. Several people came to me that it was really super interesting. The bad news is that we're running a bit behind schedule, or a bit more than a bit behind schedule. I'm not going to stress about that. The conference is just going to last 15 to 20 minutes longer than scheduled. Just so that you know, we really need to move out at some point. So the, the next uh, speaker, uh, Sotiria, hmm, I read here, Pep Doropoulou. I thought your name was Pep Doropoulou. <laughs> Very happy to have you here. Here's Sotiria. I wrote a chapter together with uh, Sebastiano Sabato, who is a co-editor of this uh, book on socio-ecological dimension of recovery, further traction of European Green Deal 
with a question mark. So in a way, building up uh, what has been discussed before. So Cecilia, Sebastiano, the floor is yours for the next three pieces. Thank you very much, Robert, uh, also for inviting me to this year's edition of uh, the Bilan Social. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to present uh, our chapter as fast as possible, given that we are running late, so that I don't say, I don't want to delay uh, your lunch time. Um, uh, so uh, just to give you an outline of what we're going to talk, the questions we address in this chapter is. Uh, whether national recovery and resilience plans uh, are characterized by a technological or an ecosocial, I'll give you this term uh, alt alternately, dimension. Um, and what role uh, are national welfare states expected to play in the context of green transition? Um, we're going to uh, work with you why we're interested in these questions. Um, and then uh, we will present a little bit the framework of analysis because, in order to explore uh, this uh, the existence or not of this socioecological transition, we had to take uh, uh, a dive into national recovery and resilience uh, plans, um, which are quite large uh, documents. Um, not always structured uh, in, a, in the same uh, way. So we had to have a way of approaching them in order to uh, see, uh, to, to, to detect this uh, uh, dimension. We will then present you some uh, macro evidence uh, that we collected for these recovery and resilience plans on the extent to which uh, there, is, there exists such a socio-ecological uh, dimension. And we will also present you uh, insights from uh, six national. And um, we will then also pr present our conclusions. And I think uh, we will leave out the limitations of our approach because we're pretty sure they will emerge uh, in the question. So in the interest of uh, saving time, we will we'll probably have to go uh, through them during the Q&A sessions. Um, so why are we interested um, in exploring the socio-ecological uh, dimension of the EU recovery. Um, well, first of all, the green transition is an objective both of, your, of the European uh, Green Deal uh, that uh, the EU has adopted as its um, uh, next uh, its economic strategy for the current decade, but also its approach to uh, meeting the uh, sustainable development uh, goals and its uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement. Um, but green transition is also one of the objectives of the recovery and resilience facility, which is the main instrument, the main uh, re recovery instrument that has been put into place in financial terms by the EU. Um, if one uh, looks into uh, these documents, there are communications and recommendations that have been published after them uh, in order to further specify uh, what needs to be done. We can see that uh, both the European Commission and the uh, regulation establishing the recovery and resilience fund call for a just transition approach um, uh, combine, when combining policies that have economic, uh, environmental or green or climate objectives and social objectives in order to make them compatible and if possible mutually reinforcing these three different uh, types, these diff three different spheres, these three objectives do not necessarily, when pursued, do not necessarily uh, work in synergetic manners. Uh, therefore, a just transition approach is one that uh, would combine uh, economic with environmental um, or climate objectives, but at the same time be mindful of the fact that uh, such policies, such a transition would have uh, social implications that would need to be uh, addressed. Um, Cut the long uh, story short, while um, domains of action, uh, policy action, and uh, desirable outcomes have been communicated or uh, recommended, it is less clear if one reads these documents uh, what kind of policies should actually be implemented to um, simultaneously meet these three types of objectives economic, social, and uh, environmental, and especially what the connection should be between uh, uh, environmental and social spheres. So this is why uh, we're interested in this uh, socio-ecological uh, dimension of uh, the recovery and the European Green Deal. Um, now, 
as I said, we're going to, we needed to know if we were going to study uh, uh, these long documents that are the recovery, the National and Re Recovery and Resilience Plans. How would we recognize um, uh, socioecological dimension if we saw it uh, somewhere in, in the RRPs and how can we make sense of it? Um, so uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, we're going to provide you what are the, how did we define um, uh, policy intervention that embody interventions that actually embody this dimension. Um, and then we will also uh, consider what role welfare states can play in this uh, uh, green transition so as to help us further characterize uh, these uh, uh, policy interventions that seem to present to demonstrate this uh, uh, joint dimension. So starting with um, a definition of the type of policy intervention that could coherently aim at green and social objectives. Um, we use a concept developed um, or recently published uh, by our colleague Matteo Mandelli. Um, so we're talking about eco-social or socio-ecological uh, policies, which are public policies explicitly pursuing both environmental and social uh, objectives in an integrated way, not parallel, in a parallel or in a silo manner. Um, this integration can go in either direction. So if we have the two spheres, the ecological green or climate, as I said, we use this term uh, interchangeably in uh, the chapter. So if we have uh, green policies, ecological policies, uh, which also are designed in a way that explicitly addresses the social consequences, uh, the social consequences, then we talk about eco-social policies. It's ecological policies that also uh, acquire uh, a social dimension. On the other hand, if we have social policies, um, which uh, uh, are also um, designed in a way that are greener, because uh, social policies can not necessarily go hand in hand with um, uh, uh, the green transition. They, they have a carbon, they can have a strong carbon footprint. So if we have so social policies that are designed in a way that uh, uh, their carbon fruit, footprint, their green uh, uh, impact is uh, becomes smaller, then we talk about socio-ecological uh, policies. Uh, so this is the definition of how, what kind of policy interventions we would be looking when we read uh, the recovery and resilience plans. They would have to be explicitly pursuing two types of objective in an integrated uh, manner. Now, what functions can welfare states perform in green transition? Because we do have uh, social policies existing already in place. Um, that, uh, you, but protect it can be can be combined in this green transition. So um, on, on this table we have first the welfare state, the different functions, and on the side we have also uh, corresponded them to uh, public policy dimensions, just to, to to make it a bit more manageable as to what we're talking about. So the first welfare state uh, function that we used in our framework defined in previous publications by. And Matteo Mandelli is the benchmarking function. What does the benchmarking function do? It's, it defines uh, social criteria and objectives to be considered and respected when designing and implementing green policies. Um, so, for example, um, uh, uh, when we design low carbon energy policies, um, taking care so that uh, uh, we ensure that they are affordable uh, uh, and that more vulnerable households, more vulnerable economically consumers have uh, more affordable access, for example, to uh, this kind of energy. So benchmarking policy is setting criteria for uh, green policies so that they have a social um, dimension. Um, and in terms of public policy dimensions, this is a normative. We can say that this is a normative function. It it, it gives us, uh, it tells us a bit how um, green policies should be in order to have to integrate this social perspective. Um, then we have a second uh, function that welfare states can perform in the green transition is the so-called enabling function that resonates um, uh, to some extent with uh, the previous presentation, as this enabling function comes in two guises. Um, 
First, it could be a social investment type of um, uh, set of policies, fostering development capabilities and human capital, um, for example, to facilitate the transition of uh, uh, displaced worker, displaced workers from sectors that have to be uh, phased out because they are not uh, contributing to green transition, to be able to, to allow them to find jobs in greener sectors that emerge uh, during the green transition. Um, second guise of this enabling function is uh, contributing directly to some of the objectives of the green transition when these policies are purposely designed in a way that reduces their ecological footprint. So we're talking about social policies that become greener. Um, for example, uh, an example of the first policy, social investments, of course, education and training, uh, reskilling and upskilling, of which uh, we heard in the previous presentation, there is uh, quite a lot uh, in the um, uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plans. Active labor market policies explicitly linked to the provision of competencies that allows people to find jobs in the green economy, the newly emerging green economy. Um, but then it could also be policies and practices for affordable social housing, uh, incorporating an ecological dimension. So for instance, um, renovating uh, social housing buildings so that become more energy efficient. So we have a social policy that has to do with housing, uh, but we add to, we make it a, have a greener aspect uh, that it did not have um, before. Um, and the, so the third function of the welfare, a welfare state can perform uh, in the green transition, which together with the enabling uh, give us policy programs and instruments as public policy dimension, is the so-called buffering. Uh, so policies, welfare state can act as buff policies can act as buffer, buffers, um, ensuring that all citizens are protected in the transition, the green transition from its impacts, and tackling any increases inequalities that derive from this transition uh, process. Because for example, uh, uh, carbon taxes affect those with um, um, lower incomes um, than those with higher incomes. Um, the fourth and final uh, function that welfare states can perform in the green transition is the so-called consensus building or conflict management. Uh, management um, management uh, function. Um, so welfare state institutions could be used to build consensus on the green transition or to manage the conflicts that uh, inevitably, inevitably emerge from it. And this is also um, a part of the concept of the just transition as it has been defined by the ILO because there is an outcome asp aspect of it. So leaving no one behind, but at the same time, it should be a process that is uh, negotiated and managed collectively and not a top down uh, process. So establish social dialogue structures and practices uh, involving employer and trade and trade union and employers representative and the state uh, would be in this respect, but also a wider array of um, um, uh, players, uh, social players could uh, be important yeah. in ensuring this that this function exists. And then <laughs> a procedural dimension of public policy. So we have the definition of what policy interventions we would be looking for in the RRPs in order to see whether there is a socio-ecological dimension. And we have these four uh, possible functions that uh, 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 welfare states can play so that we try to navigate um, um, the plans to figure out uh, whether there is this socio-ecological transition. Um, so a few practical issues. Um, uh, there is a trade off when one studies uh, national recovery and resilience plans, and try, uh, there is a trade off between um, detailed study of the measures and broad coverage. As I said, these are very big documents. Uh, in uh, all but a handful of cases, they're written in national languages. So this is uh, one can use uh, these days, but uh, it, it is uh, um, quite a, a hurdle to. We are old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> so we face it, as I said, we face a trade off uh, on how deeply we could delve, how, how well could we, we could analyze the measures versus how many countries we could um, cover. To deal with this trade off, we took a two pronged approach. So we will provide you with some 
quite crude macro evidence across uh, member states, uh, which is a planned investment by <coughs> RRF objectives. Um, and then we will present you some qualitative evidence from uh, six countries, um, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, France, Italy, and Ireland. Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I won't explain how we chose this. Uh, one of the one of the one of the criteria was convenience. It was uh, they were all countries that um, had written their uh, plans in language that we, you know, we could uh, speak. Denmark and Ireland were in English, so that helped a lot. Um, but otherwise, we tried to cover six clusters of eco welfare states. So six different types of. Um, performances of uh, member states in the ecological, environmental, and the social um, uh, dimension. We can uh, give you more details in, during the discussion. We identified um, a total of 52 measures that complied with our definition of socio-ecological or eco-social policy, the one we gave you uh, earlier. So, what we do, so starting with the macro evidence, um, here you see uh, um, the shares of plant spending on green, social, and joint green and social objectives as a share of total plant spending on national recovery and resilience plans. These data come from Bruegel. Uh, so uh, the colleagues there undertook this exercise where they studied the plants and they tried to allocate uh, investment measures by um, uh, RRF policy objectives. There are six objectives one of which is green transitions and uh, green transition and three of which one can uh, classify as um, uh, uh, I would say clearly social uh, because uh, we, we leave out the one that's uh, smart, sustainable and inclusive growth because um, uh, smart and uh, smart growth and sustainable there might be trade-offs there it's not something that goes without saying so we kept the territorial and uh, social cohesion uh the health social economic and institutional resilience and the policies for future generation these were the three pillars that we consider as social so what we calculated here where uh was um we added up uh, um, the spending on uh, that went Exclusively on social objectives, so uh, excluding uh, the green, the green objective, ex excluding social, and we also took the uh, what uh, the Bruegel colleagues had ca calculated as joint uh, spending on joint green and social objectives. So to give you again to cut the long story short, the social the the the, the part of these bars that shows there is a socio ecological dimension are the are the gray parts, which as you see are not particularly prominent. So uh, the, the, the spending, the way it has been allocated uh, uh, in the, the RRPs seems to be very little. It's a very, very small share. In some countries, it doesn't even exist. That seems to be um, uh, uh, aiming at jointly at social and uh, green uh, objectives. This is, of course, a very crude uh, measure because it doesn't, even those gray parts do not tell us how exactly um, uh, spending is allocated between the different objectives, how well they're integrated. And it also doesn't give us anything, any information about the starting points of the member states. But as we said, we face a trade off between uh, comprehensive coverage and uh, more detail. So to address uh, the problems that this kind of indicator has, we then studied uh, uh, six uh, recovery and resilience plans. We identified 52 um, measures that complied with this definition of explicit and integrated uh, um, policies aiming at social and uh, ecological objectives at the same time. And this pie chart here shows you how the different measures that we identified uh, how they are, um, they, we managed to classify them under the different um, uh, functions that the welfare state can perform in the green transition. Uh, so as you see here, 56% uh, of the 52 measures is benchmarking. So ben the benchmarking function, setting uh, criteria and principles for green policies so that they meet social objectives seems to be the normative function, seems to be the one that is um, the most prevalent, 
followed uh, not too closely, but uh, by 30% of the measures uh, being uh, classified under the enabling uh, function. So either social investment or uh, um, uh, gaining welfare states. Um, uh, even further down, we have uh, the consensus building and conflict management uh, measures, which uh, we found only 12%, and the buffering uh, function was, um, uh, no, it was a bit more. But in some countries, I mean, I have some pie charts if you want to see. Uh, later, that there are countries that doesn't even exist in their uh, program. Could you really wrap yes. Up into yes. Space? So I'm not going to go into examples. So, okay, I'll, I'll drive directly into the conclusions. So uh, we can say, I mean, I, I had hoped we could give you some examples of what these policies are from by different countries. But yeah. um, so our conclusions are that first, there is a socio-ecological or eco-social dimension present in the RRPs to varying uh, degrees, but still seems very limited if we uh, take into account the spending uh, data the way they had been uh, constructed by Bruegel. The second insight is that uh, this socio-ecological dimension uh, as of the recovery and resilience facility as expressed in the national recovery and resilience plan seems to be overall very unbalanced. Uh, so as we said, most of the, um, of the policy interventions with this uh, socio-ecological dimension pertain either to the benchmarking or the, the enabling function of welfare states, whereas consensus building and buffering functions are far, far more limited. Um, so uh, as policy recommendations, we would say that uh, more comprehensive and coherent policy frameworks are needed. Um, However, okay, we have not updated this since uh, last summer, uh, but the uh, 2022 Council recommendation on ensuring fair transition to climate neutrality did not give us much uh, reason to hope because um, uh, it goes in the right direction, but does not suggest detailed enough actions to ensure that social protection and social inclusion systems are fit for the needs of green transition. And as I said, we have some on our limitations of our approach, but I leave it at that. Let's see if there is a question on it. Thank you very much, uh, Sotiria and Sebastiano, for this. Uh, first of all, for accepting our invitation to scrutinize the socio-ecological dimension of the RPs. Um, we know that this uh, has been a difficult exercise, and uh, also an innovative approach, difficult not only with regard to the language issues that you've referred to, but for uh, including for the methodological reasons which we may discuss uh, later. So I retain that the RPs do have a socio-ecological dimension that is limited and uh, somehow imbalanced. Uh, and uh, maybe um, our discussant would like to revisit your uh, your clear conclusion that a just transition indeed re would require more comprehensive and coherent policies and maybe the, this council recommendation that you just mentioned on a fair transition would provide a window of opportunity but maybe not frank Zieber and thomas we're very happy to have you on board uh, frank you're head of units uh, at the social dg of the european commission um, okay. We would be happy to have your feedback on the chapter and, of course, anything we have during the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you for the and for inviting me. I'm from a relatively new unit in DG Employment and Social Affairs. The unit is called Fair Green and Digital Transitions and Research. We have a double mandate to do policy analysis and policy development for fair green transitions and fair digital transitions. And the a recommendation which was mentioned was one of our deliverables. I'll say what about this and what what it could or could not do, probably how it could uh, support the focus. And second, we have the title the word research now in our class. We are also under right Europe and Research DG. The employment has become a research DG, co-pairing one of the research clusters under right Europe, the Universal Society. And maybe if I have time or in the discussion, if there's interest, I can say a word of a couple of topics, which are now also which you'll find hopefully in work programs and the topic calls under rise in Europe, look at some of these issues. Um, I try to be very brief. There's a lot to be said. Um, congratulations first on the on the just timely, um, relevant and um, original analysis in a in a, in a very timely and relevant report as well, with the right questions um, on the role, effectiveness, feasibility, impact of EU policy making in a state of permacrisis. I think we have to face it. And there are the mixed messages there as well. 
um, the report in the beginning, maybe just the question, can the EU uphold its social um, ambitions in context? I think our answer is yes, it has to, and there's no alternative. And I think your chapter is one of those um, um, showing that foreign policy areas are area where we have tried to argue and keep trying to argue that these policies have to go together. So you also, uh, the, the, the report also has a um, um, spot on like the reference to the outlook on uh, more focus on strategic autonomy. Uh, the Green Deal investment plan announced by the President of Wars will come out tomorrow. A lot of those discussions are happening as, as we speak. And also, the, at the intersection of social and um, uh, energy, environmental, sustainability policy, climate policies at large. One word probably on why why this focus or why this chapter is so relevant in the whole um, to, to ensure, to ask the question if, or if we put sufficiently in place joint policies which support um, a fair transition. Um, obviously, there are lots of reasons. The first one is that fairness itself is a stated, explicit objective of the Green Deal. It's not only climate neutrality. It's not only a prosperous, competitive society, um, more circular economy, etc. A fair society is one of the objectives by 20, by 2050 on the road to it of the Green Deal uh, as such. And already the so-called 2018 long-term vision um, for climate policies and climate neutrality had stated um, that social policy cannot be an afterthought that has to be integrated from the outset in our climate policies. And that's something um, on which we may discuss whether it has been done enough, probably not, but uh, the direction hopefully goes into this right direction. And I'm, uh, I forgot this um, all it, but I, I think one could argue in the different um, distinction you make that we're gradually moving away from environmental to social policy approach yes. to more integrated approaches. At least that's something we want to push. There's also relevant the chapters also relevant as um, the IPCC reports have shown, which have said we're not on track for 1.5 degree. If we do not speed up, if we do not um, adjust our economies, um, that was uh, the warning of the latest IPCC report. The only way out would be a massive social transformation, which would come as a huge cost. In integrating social policies, making use of all of these welfare state functions is vital in making this transition a success. Similarly, last year we had the Eurobarometer survey, in fairness perceptions of the green transition. People want to do more. They 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 are clear personal responsibility in supporting a transition. They even say in difficult situations that they can save energy. Um, they even believe that, that the green transition can create quality jobs more than the, it will destroy. But there are a lot of concerns. The concerns, do I have the right skills? Can it be achieved at all? By 2050? And then energy prices obviously are a concern, um, as are also the, the support policies. Um, I would also argue that it was said that the EU has responded to the crisis by inventing new forms of solidarity, by, by um, as you say, advancing integration, European integration indeed. But there are many, many positive messages in there. Um, and the focus on distributional impacts, as you mentioned, is absolutely essential in this context. At the same time, and that's what you uh, have many examples of the tour, the tour program, the COVID crisis, one of those. Um, and, uh, and there are many others. But this brings us also to this situation where you say we're at the crossroads now, and that's why this, um, these findings are very important because we don't only provide insights in what's in the FRPs, um, uh, insights which are not so on the outside, but they open a debate on the future of social policy making, which is, which is very much on the agenda at the level. Um, and we are at the crossroads that was shown in one report last year, the so called Labor Market Development Report. Which shows yet again we are at record levels in employment. Yet again we have managed to to cushion, cushion the effects of a of a deep crisis uh, relatively well. It seems with assure, um, but the the uncertainties with the energy crisis and with the with the long term climate crisis, if you may, are getting um, getting much more virulent. And we are now really at a, a point where where this uncertainty is taking over, and there are big question marks. Uh, probably also big opportunities uh, to to shape our policies. Two comments, if I may. One on methodology. Uh, a lot to be said there. Conceptually, it's very interesting the welfare state functions and how you classify um, the the measures, investments in the RRPs into those. Um, well, this classification probably not always so easy and not so easy to understand. 
um, because it looks at some cases that can also be overlaps. For example, you mentioned uh, uh, access to essential services. I think this would be benchmarking as well as enabling public to job to job transitions, um, including through reskilling and income support at the same time, probably fall both into enabling and buffering functions. Or if you look at uh, social dialogue and collective bargaining and a lot of initiatives which go on, just transition frameworks, partnerships at, or pathways at sector uh, company level, I think one could argue that they are as well as enabling as consensus building. So sometimes this is not so clear, but maybe not, um, not an argument against it, but uh, more thought provoking. Also, I think there's a time dimension sometimes because we obviously hope that the investment in energy efficiency, renewables, energy communities on the ground will pay off in terms of social benefits or all benefits at least at some time. And these kind of trade offs are recognized um, directly in EU policy making, notably in the Social Climate Fund, for example, which mm -hmm. does allow, as first time, direct income support, it does so with a condition. Uh, it, it is temporary, meant to be temporary, but it's also stated explicitly, and uh, in the legislators insisted a lot on this, that this should be available as long as these positive co-benefits kick in of investments. Um, so probably also your welfare state functions may change in time. Um, as I said, a lot more to be said. Just We have tried to do some analysis as well on the socio-ecological nexus of the RRPs. And they're the finding based on tagging on the green pillar and climate expenditure and social expenditure methodology. They're the finding was that approximately total um, expenditure in the RIPs was 21 billion euros for 26 RPPs in this um, joint category. So probably slightly um, higher and also with higher weights for social policies and services. Mm -hmm. um, but these are different methodologies. So I think it's good to, to look further into this in more detail. Um, and uh, another point I would like to make, obviously, is that there are many, many other funds to be used for just transition. In the proposal for the council recommendation, we added, we accompanied it with a staff working document, which also had an overview of all funding tools for just transition, obviously cohesion funds, uh, innovation modernization fund, um, uh, and many other funding tools. Um, the fund of in the future, social climate fund, also play there, so probably won't even ideally have an analysis which looks into um, to all of these opportunities. And uh, if you can identify more synergies there, um, we said also that the co-legislators when setting up these funds or now revising these funds, they build in more and more transfer opportunities between the two, from the cohesion funds to the RIF, for example, also for the new Repower U chapters, which would strengthen, strengthen these joint activities even more, or for the social climate fund, interestingly, interestingly in the other direction, the co legislator suggested up to 15% of the social climate fund can be transferred to cohesion funds and used in that context because they are seen also to have the same targets. And the last comment I would like to make is one on um, forward looking, because obviously there have been a lot of developments. In what do we do? The, the recommendation on fair transition is one tool. It's a tool which is part of the Fit for 55 package. It was um, requested as part of the first Fit for 55 package in July 21, because it was clear that the Just Transition Fund the social, and the Social Climate Fund are important tools to address very specific challenges. Is out of coal or fossil fuel based industries and is affected or address um, price increase from uh, emissions trading in new sectors, buildings, and road transport, and in that case, with all reverse effects, with all distribution effects, and effects, and therefore, um, and obviously, uh, be done with this, um, and therefore, uh, there was a request to propose a council recommendation, accepted and this has uh, brought. Um, through it, that way, member states have committed to put in place comprehensive policies, active labor market policies, skill policy, but also <laughs> policy social protection and the services. We have committed to improve the evidence base, to involve all stakeholders in this. Regular also follow-up meetings, uh, monitoring uh, meetings with stakeholders, and to use all funds at all levels, EU and national, Optimally, so there's a lot of work if we want to look uh, how, how this is being used. In addition to that, 
So that's certainly something where we have mainstream, tried to mainstream climate energy concerns, sustainability concerns, not responsible in social policy making, which leads to interesting situations where you know, uh, representatives from labor ministries, from employment and social affairs ministries, really ask in the background, is it ready for us to deal with this? And we said, yes, it's for you. You have to get into this and vice versa. We do the same on the energy policy side. There you have in the context of the energy union, in particular, the NECPs, National Energy and Climate Plans. They have to be updated this June. Um, it's the first update after five years. It's a 10 year plan for energy investments to go to accompany the transition. I mentioned it in particular because there was a guidance that I recommend to all of you, which has a lot of direct reference to the transition. And although the legal base um, is not very clear about it, it has a, has a reference to energy poverty, but not to just transition as a concept as such. It's understood that these updates should address any uh, just transition aspects much more. And you do find cross references not only to our recommendation and the policy areas in India, but you also found, find, for example, cross references to referring to funding and uh, measures in other funds, including the RIF. Uh, and obviously, you have many, many more um, tools the Repower U chapter um, in Horizon, as I said, or at the international level. We have where we try to, to instill the same because we believe all of these policies need to be um, engaged in a comprehensive policy framework and uh, um, your, if your work could be expanded to this to get an even better understanding how much we're progressing there, that would be welcome. A very last sentence and then I stop. Um, we had last November the first European Employment and Social Rights Forum, a new central conference organized by DG Employment. And we had a session with stakeholders on just transition. The commissioner got questions from the audience. And the first question he got How do you monitor just transition? Just transition. Said, asked like this, I would suggest we should first look at inequality overall. If we do not bring down inequality, something is wrong also with um, uh, just overall. So this is to say it is not about transition, it's not only about taking um, into account the effects, direct effects of the green transition on people, it's broader than this. And job creation in sectors such as, just, uh, such as education, healthcare, those we heard before, or others, um, is part of this. Addressing, integrating people vulnerable, people outside the labor market mm -hmm. is part of a just transition. It's not only the direct effects we're trying to deal with. Um, all of your, the policy that are uh, assessing our policy in this context. Uh, Frank, for those very thoughtful uh, and thorough comments, also for uh, reminding us that DG employment is now being transformed in search DG. I didn't know that. We need to talk, I think. Uh, but also, thanks for your uh, suggestions for uh, further research. So, um, just a few comments. Uh, so I let the authors of the chapter pick and choose which ones I would like to uh, refer to, including uh, references to methodology, overlaps in categories, elements of time. And then let's see if there are some questions from the audience. There are already two questions on the chat as well. So who wants to go first? Thank you very much uh, for this reading uh, of the and the very important uh, considerations uh, uh, that of course will help us uh, uh, to go more in depth in this analysis. Uh, I think you are still fair on the many concepts that is relatively relatively new. A lot of work there is uh, to be done uh, both on the policy side but also on the research side. We have features and implications uh, of uh, this uh, uh, notion. And uh, so you rightly point to some uh, definitional uh, overlaps uh, uh, between our categories of the transition. Same discussions that, as we have seen uh, in uh, the previous panel, uh, are ongoing for more, uh, let's say, traditional function the welfare state, the flu, uh, and uh, buffers. Uh, uh, how to distinguish that? Mm. 
it should be improved. We needed uh, absolutely an analytical tool, uh, you know, to navigate uh, in these new uh, documents. Documents uh, and uh, some distinctions may be a bit uh, nuanced, maybe because uh, we classify as a benchmarking function. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, measures to make sure that uh, uh, more vulnerable households uh, have access to energy efficiency provision, for instance, for BG. While uh, if this uh, 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 initiative is done on, uh, I don't know, uh, social infrastructure, such as, uh, I don't know, childcare facility, it goes more on the enabling function. So here we have a bit uh, of a uh, and uh, it's also very important to uh, 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 the in the transition is a matter of both outputs uh, in terms of policies uh, and the process, the procedural aspect to arrive there. So here, our last uh, function, consensus building, uh, uh, refers more to the process involvement uh, of the social partners, of NGOs, uh, of citizens. Uh, but it's clear that it's only one part of the consensus. Uh, then the other part is uh, the output in terms of all of this. And uh, I also, we agree, uh, I think here we touch upon the ecological dimension of the recovery and resilience fraternity. I mean, uh, it's not uh, as we find that developed, uh, but uh, at the beginning, could we even take for granted that the RF, there will be this kind of social ecological policies. I mean, just transition is among the many objectives mentioned in the regulation. As we said before, Luca Rossi said also, a gender equality is there, but it's not one of the key criteria. And yet, we have this kind of measures, and we should be, let's say, there we see a bit, we classify. But we want to know how these uh, are being uh, the ground uh, that we can have a crisis on both sides. This is maybe what we identified as a uh, ecological policies, then they are being implemented in a different way. What we really were not able to catch uh, are going in that direction. And uh, uh, let's say maybe the RRF would have been kind of, I wouldn't say the least likely example of new instruments implemented just transition, but not the one for which is a, it's a, uh, the main purpose. And yet there are these kind of policies and we should see the overall work. It's a matter as usual, as we said also before, of complementarity with other policies. And uh, we say also in a recent studies that uh, more solid and structured the EU framework for the transition is emerging uh, with the instruments and the funds devoted to that objective, the just transition fund, uh, a social climate fund is to come, maybe the orientation of control policy and the council recommendation. The council recommendation that uh, weaker than uh, uh, the other initiative I mentioned, so because we have no money there, but potentially broader in order to really set the direction of uh, member states' policies. And I agree with you that uh, the challenge is, is a key implementation in the long term, how all these uh, instruments, uh, what will be the interplay between these instruments, but especially how they will be monitored. Okay. Again, for the council recommendation, uh, instrument monitoring will keep. And again, as you say, the, we need the joint effort as policymakers and researchers. There, we need more knowledge, uh, more solid analytical basis, uh, indicators, uh, and so on. But uh, I really think that uh, that one of the just transition, uh, the fair transition, is among the key challenges. Uh, uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry to say the, the this promise of promoting a green transition that is also just, uh, the European Union is a really um, with the credibility and legitimacy in the eyes uh, of uh, citizens. We already had the Gilets Jaunes. We cannot afford uh, for credibility. In <laughs> and the uh, policy makers at the national level, European level should really, I think, 
focus your attention on this. Thank you very much. Let's first, because I know that. Let me see. Let's first see if there are any questions from the audience. There are a few on the chat. To Brussels, of course, that's president. So, is there anybody who wants to question? Speakers, yes, please, sir. Hi, Hi. thanks a lot for the presentation. I'm Thanos Japas from the Gen Um, since you have six countries, you've studied six countries which have uh, different growth models, each other so Belgium, Italy, Denmark. So, I was wondering if you have identified any patterns regarding this uh, the adoption of measures that take into account both dimensions, so social and environmental, socioeconomic. Yes, um, if you uh, have identified certain patterns depending on the growth model. Of these countries, countries with a stronger uh, welfare state, maybe were more like they um, take into account this double dimension more or less. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? No, not at this stage. I'll just uh, read a few questions <clears throat> very quickly, just came in from the chat. Uh, Simone Shiru Royce, and I'm sure that I completely mispronounced your name, Simone. I apologize about that. Um, said, right, that the RP from Cyprus, it's more of a common question, presents good practices for socio ecological measures. Specifically, its RP presents investments for the development of waste management infrastructure with the purpose of employing citizens that may have difficulty accessing labor markets, long term unemployed people with disabilities ex-prisoners, um, uh, people with addictions, et cetera, with a helpful So Thank you, Simona, for uh, bringing that in. And then uh, Maria Sidu, uh, who we also heard before. So thank you, Maria, for being so active. Uh, I wonder why you classified Portugal as a lacking investment on eco-social, uh, uh, eco-social, social, ecological policies even though it has included in its RP a large housing re retrofitting program, including investment on social rental housing construction for low-income groups to climate adaptation um, uh, and mitigation uh, standards. And also a comment from Paul Wim, but he basically says that he agrees very much agrees with what Amandine said in the previous session. So Amandine is still here. You have Excellent. Um, intervention. Finally, Heinri Schmitz uh, from Demos, which I think is the German Ministry of Social Affairs. How do we best combine buffering and enabling instruments without risking household level rebound effects with buffering policies all be subject to the condition that investive measures under the uh, SCF are uh, regarding the use of funds provided. Many issues, difficult questions. I propose you really pick one or two that you find most relevant to answer. And the rest, as frankly suggested, will be the basis and the start as the, your, your comment and question uh, in DG Employment, which confirms that DG Employment is turning into a research institute. Um, you will take home for further research. So please, two minutes each, that would be great. <laughs> Yes, and um, to respond to uh, Frank's comments, uh, well, in some of them regarding the limitation of our approach, I largely with uh, Sebastian yeah. the chapter together, but uh, I found uh, very useful uh, the time uh, dimension that um, uh, you uh, alerted us to, and I think it's going to be interesting, and I would just like to um, uh, let you know that at least at the ETUI, we are planning uh, some further research taking into account the National Energy and Climate Plan. So uh, it's a research that develops in uh, uh, waves, uh, so in, in layers, we build it up because uh, doc long documents to read and uh, get our head around. Um, regarding uh, Thanos' question, uh, we did in the six countries that we uh, chose, I mean, as I mentioned, we uh, try to cover uh, the six clusters that uh, two researchers, Paolo Gazian and Katarina Zimmerman, uh, uh, have uh, identified uh, combining different um, uh, ecological and social performance. So uh, member states that do uh, have a sufficiently uh, well-developed ecological states, so they're, they're, they do well in this respect. and. Uh, welfare states. So we try to cover uh, all of them. We do have, I'm not sure, can, can I put back there? I mean, we did produce 
we, we can see some patterns, but I'm not entirely sure one can uh, uh, relate them systematically to uh, growth uh, models. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I mean, we can, uh, I can share the presentation afterwards with you, but uh, for example, we see um, uh, that Italy only has uh, benchmarking and enabling um, um, functions. So you could say that, uh, okay, the Italian welfare state not particularly strong on uh, the social, uh, on, on the activation uh, part. I mean, uh, Traditionally, so perhaps there could be a reason why uh, you know the, there's more emphasis there. If you look at the other countries, uh, Belgium, um, France, and Spain, there is a, a bit more uh, balance and quite similar patterns of distribution of the different types of uh, measures. Um, Ireland, on the other hand, only has no benchmarking, only. Uh, uh, one measure or two was it on enabling and Denmark it was all uh, um, benchmarking which may be pointing to the fact that exactly Denmark has quite a, um, a, a developed welfare state the enabling function is, has been quite prominent has been the prototype for uh, uh, flex security policy so one uh, you know could make these links but we, I don't think we can talk of a systematic uh, link at this uh, stage um, we'll start with, uh, that yet um regarding the other questions um yeah maria could you um look through why there is a reference to those because uh, at least uh, we have another paper coming up but it's not this chapter so i don't know um uh, um we we'll give more news we we'll give more news portugal on portugal uh, uh soon okay. accept that as an answer yes. <laughs> uh, how do we best combine uh buffering and enabling policies. Well, there has to be some conditionality, but uh, not at the risk of, uh, I think, falling into uh, hard warfare uh, patterns of um, uh, uh, of, uh, of buffering conditionality. Because green jobs also have to be good jobs. I mean, this is what just transition is about. The point is not to just make sure that people find something, mm -hmm. but also that good quality uh, jobs are created. So there is a balance to be struck there as with, um, uh, you know, when we talk about conditionality, the balance between active and more passive policies in the past. Okay. Sebastiano, woman, and then you have no, just uh, it's uh, the, the consideration uh, by Simone uh, uh, Cyprus. Uh, that, uh, again, uh, I think that uh, it's very interesting uh, this development to implement the youth uh, framework to part the legislation uh, and the funding. That's very important, uh, and that's been. But uh, uh, Simona mentioned uh, some good practices from Cyprus. Uh, yeah, I would raise the attention from the world because uh, uh, this kind of practices uh, in some cases can go a bit below, beyond the traditional. Uh, State provisions uh, there are more innovative examples of investigating uh, social and ecological concerns. Uh, so I think that uh, one uh, besides a clue of the instruments at the disposal of the European Union in order to advance this agenda is also to fully exploit uh, their mutual learning uh, instruments uh, when it does uh, mutual learning tools uh, and various kinds of peer reviews. Uh, of the protection committee and the ENCO committee to really explore what's going on, on the ground uh, because there are some uh, important practices, uh, important innovative uh, social policies might be there. And we need to identify, pick up, discuss, and disseminate this. That is the function that the EU has always played well. Frank, since you declared yourself as a researcher, you will have your final one minute statement. Two sentences, Sebastiano made important point on the mon um, implementation, monitoring, and follow-up of the recommendation. Indeed, I mean, the, the debate is open probably with the state of future policy making, but uh, we, we are actually now shifting and focusing on monitoring the implementation of this recommendation through the semester, through the NECPs. In particular, I would like to say that the committee you mentioned, NQSPC, uh, that we will uh, host a thematic reviews on those uh, for selected recommendations, and the one specifically on social protection, fair, fair taxation, could be one which could be interesting and which benefits from your analysis. Um, and in this context, I should say, but you're probably aware that next week, 
uh, high level group on the future of the world have taken a published report that has looked over the, what are the investment needs coming from the, the, the like the drive, like the green transition. And the other point on research, not to make too much prom promote here, but if you look, the Horizon Europe work program 23, 24 plus the two is out. So the, to give you two examples, of what we do, for example, talking, there's one on addressing housing inequalities in a sustainable and inclusive way. So we try to have topics which co combine and come up with new ideas for these type of policies. Or there's another one which asks to set up a knowledge platform and network for social um, impact assessment of green transition policy. Looking really for more and more insights like these studies to, to guide the transition further and probably go towards uh, more stringent frameworks in the future. Also, for opening the competition in that uh, budget line for Horizon 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sebastiano. We will have a three-minute break to change the table, the glasses, etc. And I hope that all of you will stay in the rooms for the final panel, which will shorten a bit because I will speak shorter with regard to the conclusions. Uh, and then all of you who are stay will be entitled to a sandwich afterwards. So please stay on board. Three-minute break, please. Three minutes. Okay, so basically what we do in the conclusions, yeah. now you can read them in English and French, so there's no need. Uh, is to firstly um, point out uh, very quickly um, some of the other social policy initiatives that have not been uh, covered in the book. Um, and the reason is very simple. As Philippe uh, Pochet said, uh, there were years where we didn't know what to write in the Bilan Social because there were no EU social policy initiatives. And now there are so many. So there is, uh, we discuss, uh, of course, uh, the European minimum wage uh, directive in the events which authors like Müller and Schulten uh, label as uh, historic. I won't tell you why uh, that they do that, but, but that's how they frame it. They're the link with minimum wages, but also the strengthening of uh, collective bargaining. And so there really a milestone has been uh, tabled. We'll see what comes out of it uh, in terms of implementation, of course. We discuss recent developments in occupational uh, health and safety. Uh, there is, has been a new, uh, there is a new EU strategic framework on health and safety, which was adopted in uh, 2021. And there are already the first uh, milestones of its implementation on which, by the way, uh, ETUC was very critical, notably with regard to the proposal to update the directive on exposure to um, uh, There is a new European, uh, European care strategy, which is, relatively uh, ambitious in our view. Um, there, the European Health Union is, uh, it, it, it being has been developed uh, further including the regulation on European health uh, data space. And then of course, a whole, uh, what would have maybe been a whole other new chapter uh, is everything that is to do with the implementation of the European pillar of social rights, which is uh, also in view of the coming uh, Belgian presidency of the Council of the EU, which we help to uh, prepare going to be very uh, relevant. One aspect that we want, that we just flag now, but we will go into, we hope in the next Bilan book, is this European platform for combating uh, homelessness. And there are recent data, recent analysis, uh, flag the surge in rent arrears across the EU. Um, numerous people being evicted from their houses. This is going to be, and this is already a big issue, uh, which to be honest, we haven't looked at uh, so far, and I hope it will come up in the next Big Social, and then there's, of course, uh, the minimum income initiative, a recommendation, not a directive, uh, but it is on the, uh, on the uh, agenda. The second thing we do in those conclusions is a discussion of uh, the upcoming uh, reform of uh, the EU's economic uh, paradigm, the economic uh, governance, uh, and our call, which won't surprise you, um, with regard to the development of a social imbalances procedure or SIP. I don't know if Sebastiano is still in the room, um, but in any case, uh, this is something that we've been pushing hard for um, from a research angle. And, and rather unexpectedly, two or three years after we started working on this topic, it is now on the political agenda, thanks to Spain and Belgium, of course, eh, who have tabled this proposal uh, in, what was it, 2019, uh, I think. Um, uh, and amazingly enough, to some extent, it demonstrates how the, the political framework has changed. This is being picked up, it's now being discussed at the level of the Council, of the Member States, Employment Committee, Social Protection Committee, their indicator subgroups, and this idea is taking hold. Whether it will be ambitious in the end, whether it will uh, uh, make a difference, 
uh, we will, of course, um, have to see. And then finally, and then I move uh, through the uh, discussions, um, what we do is uh, look further, uh, glance ahead a bit at uh, 2023, what is going to be on the agenda. Again, European Health Union, the proposal for a European disability card, uh, which will uh, again end up, I think, we hope, in the hands of the Belgian presidency uh, in 2024. Uh, an important directive on combating violence against women, which has been proposed. Uh, we hope that we hope that there will be an agreement in um, an initiative on strengthening social dialogue. Marco, Marco, you may want to refer to that. And then the final section uh, we discuss in the this strange new animal to some extent on the EU agenda, which open strategic autonomy, which is a bizarre concept that derived from. Uh, the, uh, from um, the EU's common foreign and defense uh, policy, uh, which there, therefore we haven't really looked at in the past, maybe for wrong, uh, for the wrong reasons, but what, because what we see and what we discuss in the conclusions is that this concept really went through a paradigm shift, has been enlarged and stretched and new elements have been uh, added as a result of which even the European Trade Union Confederation, to my surprise, <laughs> identified it as a strategic, as a forward-looking concept that would maybe allow uh, as, as a tool, as a vehicle uh, to support the uh, twin transition on the European agenda. If you're interested on this in a discussion on this open strategic autonomy, read the conclusions. Voila, that was the summary of the conclusions oh, wow. in four minutes. Um, and now we have, um, first of all, uh, Mary, I don't know if you would like uh, to start. Uh, Mary Collins from the European uh, Women's Lobby, and then Marco Cilento uh, from the EPUC. Happy to have both of you on board. And please, the floor is yours for the next few minutes. Mary. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. And uh, well done on the publication. It was a real pleasure to read, I'll say. And what I would like to do is provide a kind of a critical uh, constructive uh, perception from the feminist perspective. And first of all, I would like to really um, thank uh, Petra de Boucher, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, for her really good chapter on gender equality, mm -hmm. chapter five, which I do recommend that everybody read. And uh, she focuses on, in, on the gender equality strategy and has a very positive perspective on it, and we would share that. So what I would like to do is focus, zoom in, if you like, on one of the priorities of the strategy, which relates to gender mainstreaming. So we are very concerned that there is a chronic lack of gender mainstreaming in all of the EU policies, and particularly kind of the big issues, as we were talking about this morning, the green deal, the digital deal, if you like, and also in terms of the money and the whole, um, sorry, the the Recovery and Resilience Fund, the Next Generation EU, the MFF, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because all of these policies, we believe, they're based on a neoliberal, patriarchal approach. And what we're doing is transposing into a kind of a green, clean economy these kind of models. But where are the references to women? So that's one question that we would have. And for example, if you consider in the digital economy, using that word in a very broad, generic term, only 17% of women are actually employed in this sector. But there's nothing in the green agenda or the digital agenda that actually targets <clears throat> those specific measures. And when we look at the green economy, the transition to a greener economic model, and the, the whole focus is on the polluting industries, so that they are become zero carbon emissions. We're primar primarily talking about the car industry and the construction industry. And those two are the most male dominated sectors of the economy. So we believe that a care deal is missing from these two pillars, if you like, of the transition to a new economy. And we do think that the care deal is part of the green deal, a green sustainable model. And perhaps going back to the just the previous session we have now, it's probably an ecological, social aspect that's missing. Because we believe that caring for planet and caring for each other is part of the same continuum. But also, I just want to say that um, I want to be clear that um, the Green Deal or the Care Deal is not only for women. 
it would be a real possibility to break from the dominant male breadwinner model to move to a model that's equal earners, equal carers. So we believe that there is that possibility to do that, and it's been a, bit, a missed, excuse me, my voice is breaking, been a missed opportunity. So just in terms then of the recovery and the resilience funds, and together with the next generation EU package and all of the money, while member states were asked to address um, gender equality or the situation of women and men in their countries, in the guidelines, they did that, but they didn't target any funds, no earmark funds, no earmarked investments. So what we are seeing coming back in the plans is a description of the situation of women and men in the particular countries, but nothing about how they're going to be addressed. So again, there's no the fact that there's no targeted funding or earmarked funding, it means that gender mainstreaming has failed. Um, then in terms of the, um, so for example, the next MFF, what we would really want to see is that in the regulations, there is an obligation on gender budgeting, which is in fact, gender mainstreaming and financial resources. Um, so my second point then relates to the sections of the report that refer to the welfare state. And in particular, the absence of gender mainstreaming perspectives in relation to pension. Every country, uh, you know, Belgium is on the street, France, they're on the street today. Because we have to, this is a real good example of how we've missed the boat in terms of gender mainstreaming, because um, the gender pay gap, the gender pension gap, they're two sides of the one coin. If you look at the gender pa pay gap in Europe, on average, it's about 15, 14, 15 percent. If you look at the gender pension gap, it's more than double. And there are lots of arguments. Some say it's nearly 30 percent. We say it's almost 40 percent if you look at the three pillars of the pension system. However, one way or the other, it's more than double. And it has to be addressed because and it's not coming up at all in the questions relating to pension reform. Um, then my other point relates to um, decision making. So in the report you refer to, should we be qualified majority? Should it be on unanimity? But actually we're one year before the European elections and the renewal of the European Commission. And what we can see is that online violence in particular against women candidates in elections, whether it's European level, national level, regional level, has exploded. And the result is that many women are pulling out, are stepping out of that political arena. And just to give you a few figures, mm -hmm. there was a study done in um, 2018 by the Council of Europe on uh, sexual harassment of uh, women MEPs. And 85% of them, 85, almost every single one of them, said that they had experienced psychological violence and 46, almost half, they had received death threats and rape threats. So there's no, it's not, you know, we can see why they're pulling out of the actual decision making. So coming back to in the report, should it be qualified majority, et cetera? I think the issue is that if we don't look at it from a gender perspective, we actually end up having less women around the table and there will be a real serious democrat democratic um, deficit. We need to ensure that we address that, we address it now. So you mentioned the uh, proposal for a directive on violence against women and domestic violence, and we really, really want that to be adopted by the end of this year. And also the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, because it's really absolutely crucial. And then my fourth point, you mentioned the Conference on the Future of Europe gently in the report, because obviously it was ongoing still. Um, but I do emphasize the future of Europe, it's all about the future. And there is a report from the G5 plus feminist um, think tank, which shows very clearly that there was a total lack of a gender equality perspective in the terms of the content of the outcomes of the conference. For example, of the 326 measures, only 13, one, three, consider a gender related issue or include a gender approach. That's 4% of the all of these measures that are come up. So we desperately need to have a specific council formation on gender equality as we move forward. 
And then finally, mm -hmm. we believe that the progress we have seen in 2002, despite of everything, it's because we have two women at the helm. So we have for the first time ever, the first female president of the European Commission and the third female president of the European Parliament. Now, they are not symbolic figures. They do make a difference. They have made a difference. And therefore we need to ensure that women in leadership remains very much part of whatever future and whatever, wherever we go in the coming year and also in the future. Because the success and the <clears throat> of your open, what do you call it, the open strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy it will only make sense and be possible uh, and be meaningful even to explore if we have gender because we need to have a, make sure we have a gender parity to for the moment. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let me pass the floor to Marco. Okay. You mentioned a lot of topics. <laughs> Let me say, first of all, uh, to congratulate you and your uh, team for uh, this Bilan Social, the Union Europea in 2022. This publication is becoming a landmark also in our work uh, to get inputs, relevant inputs. So uh, also today show that uh, uh, how relevant and uh, well done this work. So congratulations to you and your team. Uh, Lippi is not here, but also we heard that this will be uh, to the general work. But just I want to stress how, um, let's say, synergic and complementary between <laughs> the institutes uh, with the work with the ETUC in the course of the years. Without, uh, let's say, uh, without uh, uh, avoiding dialectics uh, and exchanges that can stimulate also the ETUC side the capacity to look beyond what is appearing uh, on the very moment and to have a more uh, long-sighted views in the world. So uh, we will miss him, but uh, as you said, probably he will surely <laughs> continue to provide uh, his contribution. I'm quite confident about that. Saying that, so let's come to the real, uh, to, the, the, to, 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 to the topics you raised. Uh, I cannot avoid starting from the issue of women because I'm in charge of the coordination of the European semester and the economic governance work in the European Trade Union Confederation. And normally, uh, we see that too often the question of uh, women is the relegation to the problem of maternity, and that we address the problem of maternity and child care. In reality, uh, what we use, uh, what we look in our work in the European semester is the position of women in society and workplace. And we try to, uh, because through this, we test the quality, the status of health of the democracies uh, in Europe. That's why I like to the reference to the democratic standing of our societies. And we do this uh, in the analysis, we do uh, the wider analysis, but also in the matrix indicators we use. We also have a number of indicators that help us to uh, put our observation on, 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 the, on the position of women in society. And uh, uh, for instance, the, when the capacity to occupy apical position, for instance, which is a very important indicator. So, so gender dimension, having a continuous attention to this, yes, this is also what we try to do. In this moment where we have uh, an overlapping of several crises, uh, uh, the usual averages and analysis that the general situation are not uh, the what we need anymore, because uh, we need a very um, a new way to map the social risks in the in the economy in the society we are living in because also more than ever in these years we are moving a huge amount of resources uh because we had to react to the uh, to the pandemic and the telephone recovering from a past crisis and then we arrived the war and the consequences of the war and Every year we try to reallocate a, a, a lot of uh, resources from one sector to another, from one production to another. And this creates um, instability uh, because it creates a huge opportunity to some, a huge threats to others. That's This winning and losers is not reflected in the averages measure. Take an example of employment, 6.6% of unemployment, Everybody celebrating that the labor market is uh, resilience. 
inside these images, more than in the past, we have a situation of huge trouble for a lot of people. And, um, and, um, and we must be able to detect where the problems are in order to better use the money we allocate for the transition, for the social, for the, for the protection of people, and we cannot uh, afford what we are doing today, that we distribute subsidies without targeting them, without having a clear social risk mapping. So if we don't have this clear view, it's really what is the challenge is what, where the money goes and departs from, uh, we cannot have also good legislation that can uh, address Right. And if we don't address the real problems of people, the level of arrest and miscontent would be really high and increased. So we will have a situation where probably we have the maximum of investments, a lot of efforts in the public expenditure, and people in the street like we have today because they are totally unhappy. This is a, 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 a situation that we know where it comes from. Uh, open strategic autonomy. Um, uh, we have inside the open strategic autonomy, the capacity of the EU to react to external enemies, because we realize suddenly that we have enemies, okay? Uh, the people that don't like the European Union projects, it's, it's, it's uh, something like this. So we have Russia that is a, a violent uh, enemy, so ready to use violence to, to uh, threaten the, 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 our integration model, not only, but it also, this is the target, but we also have economic, enemies that are stronger, more aggressive than in the past, uh, like, like the, the US. So this has some implication for us also for the trade union moment. First of all, how to react to the, um, to the US plan. Um, uh, reduction. So frank speaking, the idea to say, okay, uh, we have to select amongst the several policy options, what is more convenient for the people we uh, represent, of course, the workers. And in my view, the proposal of Charles Michel to have a new fund for investment that the EU finance also with issuing of new debts is better than going with derogation to state aids. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, now the, the, the commission is approving amounts of money, billions of money that governments can spend, increasing also their deficits to finance companies without respecting the state and the rules. It's an option, yes, it is an option. But uh, if, we have, if we want to you together in solidarity, etc., it's better to have <coughs> a European fund, a new one. So the problem is not if we already have the RRF or we have still to spend money under the RRF. If in front of this, <laughs> we want to reinforce the EU projects, or we want to run the risk that we fund the EU project. So if I have to dedicate money, okay, let's make the state aid more intelligent because in the past it showed to be a too rich framework. But keep in mind that in the unity of Europe, there is also the uniformity of application of labor standards on protection of our workers and anti-social dumping measures. So fragmenting the internal market, I'm not sure is the right solution. Having a EU fund that can finance with EU debts for investments that are reflecting the open strategic autonomy is, uh, is uh, for me, the way forward. And we are discussing it. The other point is the defense industry. Someone mentioned you addressed also your book. I saw I didn't have to I slept to read it because I didn't get the time. It was just published. But I see that correctly. You say, look, in this, there is also this super controversial topic of the um, uh, defense industry and security industry. There, the governance and the weakness of the governance are crucial. In my view, for the new movement is a, a really we have to decide how we want to stay in this work because, you know, um, on one hand we have to promote the, the production of EU-owned technologies. You know, something is when you have an offensive potential that is in the hands of her, for instance, that she's alone can decide what to do. Another thing is when the entire room owns these technologies and have to decide all together what to do. So it's very less likely that you will decide to use defensive tool to offend someone. But most of all, it's more, almost impossible that you will lose this technology <coughs> one against each other if you own everything. So for the EU, it's crucial in terms of governance to develop European technologies. And if we want to 
increase our also military expenditure. We must be sure that there is this governance behind and this technology is distributed fairly. For the trade union moment, there is another possibility to use employee participation to enter in the companies that produce armaments, that produce defense, that produce the con technology, not necessarily military one, because the governance of this company must be shared. We must have a role there. Employee participation is <laughs> really an important mm -hmm. issue for the future. And in my view, should be taken on board. Uh, on wages, uh, stop me when I just, just mm -hmm. finish my time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just say two things. Um, on wages, we have, uh, uh, there is a, another problem that we have is that as for employment, uh, statistics mm -hmm. are showing that in we, wages are increasing. Mm -hmm. Are we fine with that? No, we are not fine with that. First of all, because uh, for the first time, we have an inflation rate that is not under control. In any case, in a situation of inflation, the workers and wage earners are always the losers, always. We can enter into this, but we know that this is the point and that is why uh, this must be remain on the agenda. And then you mentioned many other things like the CIP, uh, together on this proposal. I'm happy that, you know, starting with an idea, you see this idea uh, growing. What is important is the economic governance reforms it will be a, so, a social charter. And this is a concrete element that we can do, the social imbalance uh, procedures, it doesn't matter how you call it, because if we do it without a social charter, I'm afraid that we will remain in the usual status of managing mutual mistrust as member states want to do. They manage mutual uh, mistrust. The EU will become, as I was saying a few moments ago, the other uh, counterpart and citizens will, uh, will complain that the EU obliged member states to do certain things that they don't like, uh, and the entire governance uh, will create more troubles than benefits. We need a social dimension. Uh, this is one idea, we have others, and probably next future conference we'll be talking about that. <laughs> Very much, Marco. Thank you very much, Mary. Now I'm looking at the clock here. It's one o'clock. I'm getting very hungry. I see some very hungry looks in the. <laughs> so let's just see whether anybody has uh, an urgent need to have a two hands intervention. Final word to say. If not, I would propose that we take all of these comments and suggestions into uh, the lunch, which is waiting for us. At least uh, those are here. But still, let me just say a few words. Uh, so first of all, Mary, I want to thank you for uh, raising the point uh, or putting the point of gender mainstream back on the table. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, you you noticed, of course, that Petra de Bussero is very optimistic mm -hmm. about uh, what is happening at the level, also raises mm -hmm. the fact that gender mainstreaming is basically a failure, almost as strongly as you put it. Uh, but thanks also for putting on the agenda, because it means also that when we prepare our annual book on social policy in the EU, we need to be even more careful for this. So you didn't say it like that, but, you know, I perceive it like that's what you meant. And I think <laughs> editors, I see Sebastiano shaking. Let's let's talk about it. But we'll take I think we need to take this more seriously on the care deal, uh, which is on the, the care strategy that is on the table. Now you, you mentioned there is need for a care deal. Mm -hmm. We already mentioned long-term care before healthcare. So apparently this is you know going to be a packet that we will have to discuss in more detail. And when you said gender equality is not, uh, uh, is, is not an issue for women, just want to uh, mention that we uh, on last Thursday, we had the final conference of our high Horizon 2020 project, <laughs> very serious. <laughs> On inward poverty. There was a parallel session on gender equality and inward poverty. And apparently 98% of the participants in the parallel workshop were women. Yeah. I admit I was not one of the guys who I was among those many guys who were not in the parallel. So thank you for again pointing us out. Gender equality is not a, a women's issue alone. I think this is absolutely true. Um, then gender and pensions, just to say that they're are you, you're right, it's not on the agenda or it hasn't been a lot on the agenda. Just to mention that at the European Social Observatory, together with RPA in England and some other partners, um, we have been asked by the European Commission to conduct a study on care credits in pensions. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're looking at this now. 
uh, they're pursuing, uh, I don't know what agenda exactly they want to pursue, but it will be part of the next pension adequacy uh, report. And so apparently the issue is getting some leverage and it's about time. Indeed, gender pension gaps uh, double uh, the gender uh, pay gap. Online violence, uh, the illustrations that you gave about um, the threats and and what uh, female MEPs are living, it's, 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 it's so silly. And thank you for that uh, reality check. I take on board, Marco, also your um, let's say with regard to open strategic uh, autonomy, very important because it is a topic that I think is going to remain on the uh, on the agenda. And yes, there are some actors here in the room who are very interested in the social imbalances procedure. So things to be discussed uh, during uh, lunch. The only thing I want to, uh, in my last minutes, uh, I really want to thank again the authors, the editors, co-editors, everybody who has made this possible. The communication department at EUI, I don't know how they've been able to produce the book in French for which we send them, I will admit, the corrected proofs last Wednesday, and now the book is there on the table. Uh, amazing. So, Geraldine, uh, Maria, all the colleagues of the communication department, uh, congratulations. Right. With 100 participants in the room, with 180 people online, there are still uh, about uh, 17 online now. So I'm very happy that uh, these issues raise so many um, interests. Uh, don't forget to order your copy of the book. And for the next edition, we have our suggestions on gender equality, open strategic economy, discussing the new single market. I also wrote down the package of care, healthcare, long-term care, homelessness, possibly. Mm -hmm. So enough ideas, and I can reassure you, we already started on this edition. So thank you very much, and we'll be in touch. Thank you.